Mark, how's it going? Who is this? Yeah, so remember that Ninjago video we made three years ago that everyone hated us for and we were gonna remake it, but then, then we just never did? What? Yeah, so I was thinking we could finally do it, and instead of clowning around this time, we could seriously review it. There are 15 seasons, by the way. Um, don't call this number again. Mark? Mark? Hello? Lego Ninjago is a property I've always had an odd fascination with, just for how much of an anomaly it slowly turned into. In the beginning, it started life as a fairly typical brand tie-in show, coinciding with a series of Lego sets and toys. At the time, you could compare it to stuff like Legends of Chima or Lego Nexo Knights, series that, while decent, mostly existed to fill up a time slot before another show took its place. They were disposable content by nature, usually lasting one or two years before cancellation, and Lego Ninjago Jago Masters of Spinjitzu seemed like just another drop in the bucket. Its pilots aired at the start of 2011, and it was expected to end in November 2012, following the second season finale. But fans were unsatisfied with it ending there, so it kept going. And not for one or two seasons either, no 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 no. From 2014 onward, another Eight full seasons were created, going all the way through to 2019, finishing after 98 22-minute episodes, an unrelated theatrical film, one special, and ten seasons. Needless to say, it went for longer than anyone could have possibly imagined. And if the story ended there, it would have been more than enough Ninjago content for a couple of lifetimes. But hardly two months after it ended, in the exact same year, LEGO decided to continue the series again in an 11 minute format with a new crew under the simplified name of Ninjago, going for an additional 112 episodes, special, and 5 seasons, ending in October 2022. But then, Netflix picked up the series for a soft reboot going back to the 22-minute format called Ninjago Dragons Rising, and it's currently in the middle of the first of two confirmed seasons. So at the least, Ninjago will continue running for a grand total of 17 seasons, consisting of 250 episodes, over the course of at minimum 14 years. What in the goddamn... That's longer than the run of Chima, Nexo Knights, The Freemaker Adventures, Mixels, and Lego Monkey Kid combined. All series that, mind you, were released while Ninjago was running and were meant to replace it. The pilots aired when I was six years old. I'm currently 19. Long-standing franchises have come and gone. Empires have been built and destroyed in less time. How is it feasible that the Lego Ninja show about elemental masters that spin good has been able to continue for this long? Who's watching it? How is it successful enough to keep going like this? Those are the questions that I've asked myself constantly for years, as back in the day, I stopped watching it around season 5 thinking that was the end. And could you blame me for assuming as much? That a series had run its course and finished after a respectable 5 year run? Like, you gotta admit, the sheer amount of content generated for this franchise is kinda ridiculous for how relatively obscure it is to most people. I will tell friends the number of seasons it has, and half of the time, they don't believe me, which is understandable. There aren't too many ongoing series old enough to open a Twitter account that have flown completely under the radar like Ninjago has. And that absurdity was what led to me, back in 2020, as part of a silly little collab, deciding to make fun of it by saying I would review the first and second seasons, but actually reviewing the first and eleventh season, because, but, well, the number eleven can be read the same as a Roman numeral two in certain situations, so... Yeah, it wasn't a video I took too seriously. I even included a sketch in between the season 1 and 11 portions to show I was messing around, but, um... If you look back at my catalog from 2020, you may notice that video isn't around, and the reason for why is that, to my shock, after the video was uploaded, it slowly got a heavy downpour of enraged Ninjago fans mad at me for not giving the series a full look. And to be honest, I didn't help the matter. I'd never gotten that much backlash before on a video, so at first I was sincerely apologetic. I made a comment talking about my shame, how I wouldn't do this again, etc. It was all very formal and Logan Paul of me. But after a while, I stepped back and realized how hilariously stupid this whole situation was, so I like, changed the thumbnail to a Lego Joker and, uh, and I wrote why so serious in the comments section.
Okay, talking about it in retrospect, it's pretty blinch-worthy, but I was a dumb 16-year-old, what are you gonna do? Point is, I pissed off the fan base with a poorly thought-out video, and for the past three years, I've had this chip on my shoulder wondering, what if I did talk about all of Ninjago? So, that's what I'm gonna do here and now. There are 15 completed seasons out as of writing, so I'm gonna review, and why not, at the end, rank all of them from worst to best. But before I can dive into the full series, I gotta get one thing out of the way real quick. The four prologue episodes that, lucky me, aren't included on streaming services, so... Sorry about the quality. But before that, I want to talk about a service that'll do you right every time with delicious pre-made meals geared to your specifications. And that's this video's sponsor, Factor. Now, you might remember that in the past, I've also promoted their sister company, HelloFresh. And that's because, fundamentally, they both provide enticing meal variety delivered right to your door. However, recently, I haven't had as much time to meal prep or cook, being so busy with videos. So I've taken an interest in Factor for their convenience. Having just as many options to choose from for people of all stripes, with meals made from fresh ingredients by gourmet chefs that you can microwave in two minutes while getting your daily nutrients. Not to mention that, as someone who doesn't get nearly enough exercise, I can choose dietitian approved calorie-smart meals that are all 550 calories or less per serving, while on occasions I want to treat myself, I can order from their Gourmet Plus option for something extra special. They're the kind of service I personally find a lot of use out of, so if it sounds good to you, you can head to Factor75.com or click the link below and use code JUSTSTOP50 to get 50% off your first Factor box. Thanks again to Factor for sponsoring, and on with the video. Yep, these are pilot episodes. Not all that much to say about them. They're fine. Sufficient. Can't say there's anything terrible, I'm just not too invested since it was super basic and hardly remarkable. The sarcastic but wise Master Sensei finds a hot-headed boy who doesn't play well with others and what? Puts him on a team consisting of a wise cracking adventure, a stern responsible tough guy, and a stoic naive one that doesn't get sarcasm. Yes, it was a joke. Ha ha. <laughs> Now, while learning to accept each other as a team, they need to retrieve their corresponding golden elemental MacGuffins and Fireboy's independent sister before the evil shadowy villain uses them to come back from hell. Though we don't call it hell because it's TVY7. But things get complicated when it turns out that what? Times two? The shadowy villain is Master Sensei's evil younger brother, who gets away in the end after the group learns teamwork and does a super duper mega monkey team hyper force go combo move, swearing to stop him if he ever returns. Do you get what I'm saying? It's so overdone. After all that, I'm surprised we didn't get a Chosen One prophecy. Though I guess I'm not turned off by the premise. Several shows have taken this type of unoriginal setup and made it work, so it has potential, but I've also seen this exact pitch and execution a million times. And this doesn't do much to distinguish itself early on. In fairness, the elemental powers are interesting in that they don't follow the typical fire, earth, water, and air structure. Replacing the last two with ice and lightning, that's shaking it up but, eh, I'm not seeing too much promise right now. It literally ends with an unironic catchphrase plus everybody laughs as the camera pans out moment, so I'm not picking up anything special, but eh, it's basically two episodes. A lot can change with 13, so let me see what a full season can do. Yeah! Okay, that Chosen One jab was a cheap shot, but hey, looking on the bright side, I think compared to most Chosen One plot lines, Ninjago handles it in a surprisingly unique way. Usually, these stories start with the main protagonist being chosen, whether to their shock or delight, and figuring out what it means to take on the role so suddenly. It's a format that's been done over and over again for years, meaning it takes a lot to stand out. And in those typical stories, the naming of the Chosen One is the inciting incident to get the plot moving, as that's where the lead will get their problems and goals from. But in Ninjago Season 1, they take a fairly nuanced approach. The first episode does reveal to us that there's a prophecy surrounding the Green Ninja who will surpass all the others, but it doesn't go straight to telling us who it is, leaving the title up in the air as a contest between the group. And not in a traditional sense, mind you, there's no tournament held to determine who's the best at being green. We already know who'd win that contest. But rather, it's treated as a little challenge amongst the ninja, who, across the season, try to prove they're worthy of being the chosen 
one through their achievements. It's not an element of the season that's all too highlighted for the first half, mostly being left in the background as something they'll get serious about later, but I feel like that was the right approach to keep it from overtaking the main storyline before it was supposed to. And it helped naturally transition those fun contests into opportunities for character growth, as after a certain point, they become moments for the ninja to unlock their true potential, an awakened state that signifies the ninja have come to terms with themselves and gotten a deeper understanding of who they are. It's honestly a great setup for deeper character exploration, as in the prologue we only got to know the ninja as their stereotypes, and while that was fine enough for a 44 minute special, they're not going to get viewers engaged if they don't have some depth, some meat. And this is a practical method to flesh them out that's sorta hit and miss, going between absolutely phenomenal and extremely underwhelming. At the top you've got Kai and Zane, who I put in a similar league together for both having awakenings that served as the payoff of their personal struggles over the season. From episode 1 we were getting hints at how Zane wasn't exactly normal compared to the others, missing common social cues and alluding to a mysterious past he had no recollection of. I gotta give the show props, it was a properly foreshadowed mystery, and having the final reveal be that he's literally a robot was both funny and, with his backstory revealed, genuinely endearing. This show hasn't done too much for me emotionally, but Zane's episode was undoubtedly the most successful at getting its sentiment across. Plus, it opens up tons of room for Zane to develop in the future, so that makes it a highlight. And while it's not nearly as heart-wrenching as Zane's, Kai's story was done thoughtfully too. Obviously, with a chosen one prophecy, there's bound to be someone that takes it closer to heart than others, so making that a part of Kai's personality, yet saving his transformation for last and making it be about letting go for the sake of others? That's smart and effective. Definitely more competent than Jay's story, which knows what sort of lesson his awakening should have, but botches the delivery, missing the chance in making it better. On its own, the episode plays out like the typical be yourself story, with Jay trying to pretend he's someone else for the approval of Kai's sister Nia, learning he should be himself, but what makes it less impactful than Kai or Zane's stories is that there was no build up beforehand. This is a supposedly personal issue that's brought up and concluded in the same episode it was introduced as opposed to the first two, whose problems were foreshadowed from early on. And the weird thing is, Jay had a perfect chance to set this up as a pre-existing part of his character, yet somehow, it was entirely overlooked. Now, I'm not gonna directly tell you what I'm thinking here, but I wanna see if you can piece it together with this one factoid we learn about him from the beginning. He was born in a junkyard, and his parents are incredibly embarrassing. Wait until you hear the story about the time I caught him kissing his pillow. <sighs> Are you picking up what I'm throwing down here? Is it not clear as day that they could have easily integrated this liar element into his character by having Jay pretend he didn't come from a junkyard? I mean, the pieces are already there, just rearrange it so he lies about where he came from, not because he's just embarrassed by his parents, he's ashamed. Ashamed that he didn't go to a dream school to develop his skills, but due to his circumstance, he got them from somewhere seen as inferior. Then the episode could be about Jay not just accepting accepting himself, but being proud of his upbringing, as it made him the person he is today. It could have been just as great as Zane and Kai's if it took advantage of the ideas it had, but as it is now, the only thing Jay's awakening has going for it is that it isn't Cole's, which fails in execution, theming, and especially foreshadowing. In the prologue, we learn that Cole is the strong-willed, friendly, but responsible one. So tell me, how, in any way, does that relate to being pressured from a young age to live up to his father's expectations? When was that woven into his character prior to this episode? It sure as shit wasn't implied before, and I could have accepted this, despite its lack of foreshadowing, if they'd tried to present the theme in a way that only Ninjago could. But Cole's story isn't just the least established for his character, it's the least ambitiously creative. I've seen the son not wanting to disappoint parent mixes his real talent with the one he's expected of to impress and stay true to himself story a hundred times, and excluding a bit of snake fighting near the end, that's all it is. There's no robot reveal, or turning into a snake, or saving a child from lava, it's just… dance competition. Nothing special, nothing new. But regardless, even if I have my grievances, all these stories relate back to the Chosen One plotline seamlessly, giving each character, more or less, a backstory and struggle that, upon resolving it, could make them legendary material, adding to the mystery. Of course, in the end, they decide to go for another cliché, making it so none of them were the Green Ninja, it was actually Lloyd, the son of Big Bad Garmadon, all along, but 
thematically it works, and leads to some shockingly poignant commentary, as Lloyd is the prime example of don't judge a book by its cover. When we're first introduced to this kid, he gives off the impression of your average rotten brat trying to follow in his dad's footsteps. He breaks out of boarding school, terrorizes villagers, and in his quest to be taken seriously, releases the main villains this season, the Serpentine, who keep inevitably turning on him and causing additional problems. Just all in all seems like a little shit who's gonna keep causing problems until he's properly punished, but in the end, it's not a punishment that gets him to change. It's his uncle Master Wu's kindness and understanding, as he knows Lloyd's really only doing this out of a mixture of seeking approval and not knowing any better. I mean, he's not a villain, he's ten. Just look at what he did with a literal army of killer snakes at his beck and call. Steal candy, build a secret base, take over the boarding school he was bullied at for not being evil enough. These aren't despicable acts of cruelty, they're what a kid thinks evil people do. His actions don't have any of Garmadon's malicious intent, he He's simply imitating that maliciousness to fit in, having grown up in an environment where it was encouraged. He wasn't bad by choice, it was just what he was always told he had to be as the son of Lord Garmadon, so he leaned into it thinking that was the only way for him to be accepted. But. It wasn't, and Wu understood that. He saw that Lloyd was, in his own misguided way, looking for a place to belong, so he let him come along with the group, giving him the opportunity that society never gave. And with it, he proves he's not only not defined by his father, he's the opposite. The destined green ninja prophesies to defeat him. But the title itself doesn't matter in this instance. What's important is that it represents how Lloyd and Garmadon aren't the same person. That no matter what society says you're destined to be, it doesn't mean they control you. People can give you labels all they want, whether it's good, evil, or something in between. But ultimately, you choose how others see you. In fact, this lesson ends up being relevant to Garmadon as well, who, in spite of his involuntary compulsion to do evil, cares about Lloyd and helps him when it matters. It's too bad he was sidelined as the main villain this season for the Serpentine, who are, you know, adequate villains on their own. It's clear they were thought up with corresponding Lego sets in mind, and the crew had to work around that instead of vice versa, but as far as Monster of the Week baddies go, they do the job. They're your regular ancient evil beings banished away and looking for revenge, containing color-coordinated tribes that each have a special ability the ninja need to overcome. It's all fairly standard, but efficient for this type of series, and their leader, Pythor, is definitely charismatic enough to hold my attention. I wouldn't quite put him in Garmadon's League, as he's more of a vessel for other characters' development rather than himself, but he does have qualities of his own that set him apart as a villain. Most prominently, he's got this half-composed, half-demented attitude towards getting revenge for being locked away, and it gives him a crazier, less predictable edge than Garmadon, who isn't nearly as chaotic. As far as comparisons, the two are both maniacal geniuses that have a hard time keeping their composure, but while Garmadon is trying to restrain the evil within him, Pythor is holding back an uncontrollable rage that, if anything, I'm disappointed they didn't use to greater effect as a part of his character. It works fine as a justification for why he unleashes the all-consuming Great Devourer to swallow Ninjago to overcome with revenge to see the downside, but I feel like it would have been more effective if we saw a gradual decline, going from composed and in control to slowly less logical as his plans fail. However, he just stays about the same at all times, and in the end, his unleashing of the Devourer becomes less about him as he gets eaten right away, and it turns into an opportunity for Garmadon to follow in Lloyd's example by slaying it, propelling another character forward over himself, leaving Pythor to wallow in stomach acid. He was super entertaining as is, don't get me wrong, I just wish he could have been more than a narrative tool for other characters. The same can be said for Nia, who goes from seemingly having an arc that's all about her finding a voice to propping up another character. Let me explain. Upon feeling left out for not being an elemental master, Nia decides to help others by becoming a mech samurai in secret, and at first, this secrecy was understandable, as she wanted to help but wasn't sure how the group would react, having excluded her from missions before. I didn't mind that she was keeping it from them, since there was a good motivation for her to do so. After a certain point, though, it started getting suspicious that she wouldn't just come out and tell everyone. Like, both Sensei Wu and Kai learn about her secret before the the others, who should realistically be the only ones that matter, and they approve. Yet she keeps silent for another two episodes, and at the time I thought that was odd. Or, it was. Until I reached the episode where, as a parallel to Jay's story of pretending to be someone he isn't, Nia reveals that she's Samurai X as a way of showing her true self. And yeah, it's a pretty forced reveal. In idea, I don't dislike it, having the two mutually be honest to coincide with Jay unlocking his true potential, but 
With the episodes prior in mind, it comes off as if Nia's story this season, one that wasn't introduced until a few episodes before this, was undermined and stretched out to prop up a more prominent member of the team. And that sucks, since Nia had the makings of a compelling character, she's just underutilized for a majority of the season. But it's whatever. At least on a positive note, the ninja are aware now, so maybe in season 2 she'll play a larger role, among a couple other changes I'd hope to see. As while this season was enjoyable, it was all around a mixed bag. On one side, we got multiple cliches and stereotypes subverted or used to their best ability, doing more with them than I'd ever expected they would. On the other hand, we got cliches and stereotypes that kind of stayed that way, never rising above. Some characters had phenomenal growth that was foreshadowed and given time to develop, but many had flimsy developments or didn't get nearly enough attention for how much promise they had. The villains were practical and did their best when necessary, but they weren't the most intriguing. Really, the only elements I can say were used to their fullest potential are the animation and soundtrack, both of which are incredibly well done. They contribute this dynamic, almost cinematic look and sound that I hope will stay just as nice moving forward. No, Well, if it isn't my old nemesis, genie rules. Looks like I should have been more specific with my wording there, since it looks like the music and animation have stayed consistent, but everything else has utterly gone to shit, including in the villain department. And I gotta tell ya, I wasn't expecting that. Seeing as this is the season that's focused on Garmadon, a guy we've had hyped up from the start as a sympathetic character who, against his will, was forced into wanting destruction while hoping for his son's safety. He carried a menacing but multifaceted personality that made his dynamic with Lloyd stick out, and thankfully, that struggle stays just as enthralling as their destined battle gets closer. But unfortunately, it's outweighed by the fact that he's become infinitely less menacing as a villain. How so? Eh, the best way I can put it is that ever since he killed the Great Devourer, he's been on a pure diet of brain tumors. Or, in other words, he's turned into a gargantuan idiot. And I blame one thing for being the root cause of his IQ's downfall. It's an item called the Mega Weapon that Garmadon gets two episodes into the season, and it's way too overpowered for its own good. See, the ability this fusion of the four Golden MacGuffins has is that, once a day, it can create anything Garmadon wishes before it zaps his power. And to that, you might be wondering what the restrictions are to keep it from being too insanely abusable, but I've already said it. Confused? Eh, I know I would be, so let me reiterate. The Mega Weapon's restriction, aside from draining Garmadon's power for the day after one use, is that the wish itself needs to be a creation. He can't explicitly use the weapon to wish for the destruction of the ninja, it's gotta be more creative than that, but... This is stupid, as it wouldn't take that much thought to destroy the ninja using a creation. After all, the weapon, as far as we know, seemingly has no limits as long as it isn't used to destroy. So, let me ask you this. Why doesn't Garmadon wish to create an incurable instant poison that just so happens to spawn in the ninja's bodies? Why doesn't he do that? It's not like creating something to cause harm is against the rules. There's no caveat of, you can't create anything with the intention to destroy. It's just a simple wish for a creation, not destruction rule, so with that in mind, it's not much of a restriction at all. I get that the writers are going for a sort of narrative irony, like, ooh, a guy that wants to destroy has to use a weapon that can only create, but do you guys understand how many deadly things can be created? Guns, cannons, nukes, bombs, swords, gas, spears, poison plants or animals, cartoon anvils. Just wish for any of these things to spawn right above the ninja's heads, Lloyd excluded, and boom, dead. It should have been that easy for him to win. I can lay it out as a three-step process. Step one, kill the ninja with cartoon anvils. Step two, Lloyd never unlocks his true potential or becomes the green ninja, so you guys don't fight. Step three, take over Ninjago. That should have been what happened the moment he got the Mega Weapon, but it's not for one reason. The writers never considered it. They only ever thought about what wishes would move the plot forward in the way they wanted it to. So despite having all this power, Garmadon continually uses it for dumb shit, making him look like an idiot who doesn't understand the power he truly has. And it's made even more frustrating by the weapon's total lack of consistency in what it can do and what it takes to work. Like, in the beginning, the weapon follows its own rules pretty faithfully. Garmadon wishes for a pirate crew, he gets it. He wants doppelgangers of the ninja to go out and kill them, he gets it. But then, 
What's this? He wishes for an insurmountable object to block the ninja's path, but it's not insurmountable. It's a hole. And the ninja cross it, so... What the fuck? That's not what he wished for. So, why didn't the weapon do what it asked him to? Are there limits now? Do certain wishes cost more than others? Is that why in the next episode he can't just wish for a dinosaur? He needs to go to a museum with its bones on display and wish for it to, quote, be young again? Because I don't remember him needing to do that for the doppelgangers or pirates, so it's kind of weird that now he needs to go to a specific location and make a specific wish for it to work. Oh no, wait, I, I know why he's in this scenario. It's so the ninja can get caught up in the wish and become young, too, so when they find a way to turn back, Lloyd accidentally gets aged up as well, speeding along his development. Wow, it's almost like that was a contrived situation that, based on the weapon's powers, wouldn't have been necessary to begin with. Fancy that. Though I suppose I shouldn't be too surprised they'd bend the rules like this, considering that right after, Garmadon straight up wishes to go back in time so he can stop the ninja from forming. What the fuck does this have to do with creation? Like, I'm not being rhetorical here. I genuinely have no idea how traveling through space and time has anything to do with creation. That is, unless you want to count the temporal vortex Garmadon uses to pass over, in which case, why has he never tried to use the metaphysical aspects of this weapon to create a black hole or some shit? We could be looking at a universe destruction level item here, and Garmadon can only think of using it to keep some teenagers from meeting, which, by the way, he fails at, in the process losing the weapon forever. And you want me to take him seriously after that. You expect me to watch that pure display of incompetence and still see him as a threat going into his next plan. All right, I'll bite. Let's go with that. Fuck it. There's a second half to the season where he doesn't have the weapon. If we want to give the benefit of the doubt that it was all the weapon's fault and judge how Garmadon measures up as a villain after he loses it, He's still a fucking moron through and through that gets played for a sucker when all the warning signs were there to stop him. You see, right after his first plan collapses, Garmadon turns to unleashing the hidden dark half of Ninjago's Islands, and upon reaching it, he meets the literal embodiment of evil itself, the Overlord. A being that I would describe as the most untrustworthy character imaginable, who tells Garmadon he'll get unlimited power if he does exactly what he says and puts on an evil helmet. How is it possible that anyone, let alone Garmadon, would reasonably fall for this? Like, when it came to Pythor, I understood the anger caused by his want for revenge gave him such tunnel vision he couldn't see the underlying flaws in his plan. It made sense with the character he was. But Garmadon has never been like that. Up to this point, he seemed to think his plans through with some modicum of rationality, no matter how stupid they were. But here, he blindly follows the instructions of the, to repeat, embodiment of evil, working under the assumption that he'll get limitless power out of it. And hey, why wouldn't he? Super Hitler is such a selfless, generous guy. He's gotta be trustworthy. Just listen to that melodic voice. The ninja may be getting stronger. Okay, being real for a second, nobody with a brain should have fallen for this Garmadon especially. I can't think of a single excuse for why a character like him, who's been evil for so long, couldn't pick up on all those red flags unless he was dumbed down to an absurd degree, same as he was in the first half of the season. At best, you could blame it on his evil compulsion guiding his actions over reason, but that's speculation at best, since his whole compelled to do evil thing is so underexplained and vague. In season one, we learn he got bitten by the Great Devourer as a kid, and its venom slowly turned him evil over a period of years, but what does that mean? How does one become evil against their will? The show seems to imply that the evil within him urges Garmadon to do bad and harm others, but how does it do that? Does his body involuntarily move on its own? Is there a voice in his head that's constantly nagging him to do evil? Has the regular Garmadon, the one that cares for his wife and child, been imprisoned by a malevolent alter ego? Is his state of mind fundamentally altered to view the world through a warped lens compared to others? I don't know. The deepest description we have is that evil courses through his veins, but that doesn't give us an adequate understanding of what he's going through, and I'm not asking these questions as a gotcha. I want to know what makes him tick to see if his stupid decisions have a rational justification, but I don't. So it leaves room for plot holes and contradictions in his character. Near the end of season one, Lloyd has a confrontation with Garmadon about the ability to choose, and in the end, the message is that we hold the keys to our own destinies. But what complicates it is that 
we don't know if Garmadon has control. We don't have any visualizations or descriptions to help us see things through his eyes. And I was fine overlooking it in season one, assuming we'd get a deeper understanding once he became the central villain, but all his episodes are mega weapon shenanigans that don't bother with the subject. His character gets no additional depth. We learn nothing about why he's compelled to do evil, and then he plays second banana to the Overlord for the rest of the season, who, by the way, is an incredibly bland antagonist that doesn't deserve the spotlight. His end goal is almost identical to Pythor's, unleashing the evil force to destroy Ninjago, but he doesn't have any of the personal drive. It's just so darkness can overcome the light, and all that unspecific dumbassery. He adds nothing unique to the series after he's introduced, and more than that, I'd argue he ruins any emotional turmoil the final battle between Lloyd and Garmadon could have had. Now, I didn't think I'd have to spell this out, but what made it such a difficult decision for both of them to fight was that they were father and son. It's a classic turmoil that works for a reason, but in the second to last episode, the Overlord possesses Garmadon's body, so it isn't a fight between father and son anymore, it's a generic battle between good and evil, which on its own is frustrating, but becomes even worse when you take into account that season two was all about preparing for this fight. It's literally called Legacy of the Green Ninja. The point of the story is for us to see Lloyd grow from an untrained kid into a confident fighter ready to take on his father in the final battle. So by removing that factor, the buildup becomes totally meaningless. Though then again, I shouldn't be giving the build-up too much credit, as it missed the point and focused on the wrong things too, giving the ninja themselves way too much screen time without Lloyd present. I mean, seeing as this season is meant to be about Lloyd unlocking his true potential with the help of the now-experienced ninja, you'd probably think a majority, if not all the plots, would be centered around that, whether it's training, helping him come to terms with himself, that sort of thing, but no. During the first block of episodes before he gets older, Lloyd barely does anything. More often than not, he's usually the catalyst for an episode rather than an active participant. For example, in the first episode of the season, the ninja need to get a new place for Lloyd to train, so we follow them through various side hustles trying to earn cash while Lloyd stays behind in the background playing video games. He barely contributes to the plot in any meaningful way, gets almost no screen time dedicated to his training, and by the time he turns into an adult, we've barely learned anything new about him or seen Lloyd grow as a person whatsoever. If anything, the sudden aging up felt like a cheat code to make him stronger, since they hadn't given him time to grow naturally. And though he does become active in the story after that, he still doesn't get any nuance. In an ironic twist of fate, it's actually a quite similar problem to Garmadon's struggle with being evil, in that we don't see Lloyd's journey despite that being the point of this season. We hear that he's training, we're shown that he's improved from it, but we don't see him unlocking these abilities organically through training or self discovery. We don't know how he's emotionally matured or better comprehends his place in the world. We're just told that he has powers now and we're supposed to take the show's word that he got him legit. It's such an oddly inauthentic approach to a season that should have been about us seeing Lloyd grapple with the real possibility of fighting his dad and training to beat him. Not that it matters anyway, seeing as during the final battle he fights the Overlord and wins by simply proclaiming he's the ultimate Spinjitsu master of destiny, killing him with his new magical glowing plot armor that literally came out of nowhere. And when I say that, I mean there was no reason given for it at all. It is the biggest ass pull I have ever seen in any piece of media. There's no revelation Lloyd comes to to validate this transformation. He isn't given the strength to use his ultimate power via some external force. He hadn't given up all hope but was cheered on by the people of Ninjago, symbolically giving him the power to unify the dark and light halves through his ability. And as I said before, Lloyd isn't fighting his father here, he's fighting the Overlord, so he doesn't gain the power through finding the courage to stand up to his dad and be the hero everyone needs. From a logical, thematic, and literal point of view, it has no explanation or merit. It is a deus ex machina power-up that comes from thin air and should be taken at face value for what it truly is, a contrivance the likes of which we have never seen. The ultimate contrivance. They've gone a level beyond bullshit. Elephant shit. But have no fear, if that's a little too much fecal matter for your taste, I've got several smaller contrivances this season that are just as comical. I couldn't fit these bits into any other part of the review, so it's just gonna be a constant barrage of brainless ideas.
<clears throat> Number 1. The stone army the Overlord uses to take over Ninjago is brought to life by the Great Devourer's Venom. The issue with that being it happened 7 episodes into Season 2, as in, multiple weeks after it had been defeated. How long could it have possibly taken for this powerful Venom to seep a couple meters below the ground? The world may never know. Number 2. Right after this poison revives the stone warriors, Lloyd's mom, who's been absent for the entire series and Lloyd's life up till now, returns to give an essay-long exposition dump about the warriors and the dark side of Ninjago. Oh, and she left Lloyd at a boarding school meant for turning boys evil so she could go looking for a way to stop the battle between him and Garmadon from happening. Why didn't she tell anyone about how Lloyd would be the Green Ninja if she knew? Why did she have to drop him off at a boarding school for future villains? Why couldn't she write to him for over a decade? Number 3. Remember Zane's unnamed inventor, who, as a part of his backstory, was revealed to be long dead? Turns out, unbeknownst to us, mere seconds after Zane's memory switch was shut off, the inventor was brought back to life by the skeletons from the prologue. Why didn't the skeletons bring this up during or after those episodes? Why indeed. Gotta be a thoroughly explained, legitimate reason, I bet. Number 4. Watching Barack Obama. As all hope appears lost, with the ninja stranded on the Dark Island and the Overlord running rampant across Ninjago, they're miraculously saved from total helplessness after Lloyd's mom Misako reads the Green Ninja prophecy closer and finds out there was a mech suit just lying around for them to use. How convenient! She must have spilled ketchup on the scroll during lunch! And with that, I think I've said all I wanted to get out. In summary, this season is a massive clusterfuck of cliches, contrivances, underdeveloped or underutilized characters, random thoughtless new additions to make up for plot holes, stupid or generic antagonists, and... Is that it? I feel like there's something I'm missing here, some extra element that I wanted to see more of but didn't- Oh, hold on! Wait, Nia! Oh my god, I totally forgot about her! I was hoping to see her have a more prominent role this season. Ah, <laughs> uh, yeah. She does almost nothing but get captured and turned evil near the end this season. That, that That's her big contribution to the team as the independent girl of the series. Totally useless, much like this season itself. The one upside was the addition of Dareth, a spoof on 70s martial arts movies who absolutely radiates unspoken Riz. Aside from him, though, this season can go to hell. I have no clue how it could get any worse, but I'm morbidly curious to see if it can. Jump up, get back with Alright, so if you were paying attention back when I mentioned the cancellation status of the series, this video already feels so far off from that moment, so I don't blame you if you don't, I brought up how Season 2 was originally intended to be the end of Ninjago altogether. And if you look at how the season concluded, it does really give off that vibe. The Overlord, who represents evil itself, is defeated, Lloyd unlocks his true potential to become Super Saiyan God Ninja, Garmadon gets purified by Lloyd's Deus Ex Beam and turns into a good guy, everyone's happy, all's well that ends well. We might have gotten there through a series of progressively nonsensical plot beats, but they're done. There's nothing left for Ninjago to do. Or is there? A Lego executive ponders, looking at the sales numbers for Ninjago build sets. Uh, no? The creators reply? Or is there? Okay, fine, jeez, we'll think of something, god. And that's how I imagine Ninjago Season 3 was decided, considering the writing staff transparently didn't have that much to add to the table going in. I mean, they say that when they were asked to return, they had so many ideas they had to filter them out, contributing to a longer production schedule, but if you're asking me, and by watching this video I presume you are, this season gives off the opposite vibe to that in just about every regard. Granted, it's not all bad, there are a few new ideas in here that stick out as decent, but a majority of it feels like the result of grasping for straws to keep the series going. Especially the conflict, oh my god, the conflict. It's such a lazy attempt at rehashing old problems through a new aesthetic, I can't believe it's not fanfiction, it's so unbelievably forced. The way it goes is that, to kick everything off, we learn the Overlord, who, reminder here, was just obliterated into 
absolute nothingness by Lloyd's Deus Ex Beam somehow survived. How did he do that exactly? Doesn't matter. He just found a way. He was like in the essence of the soil or some shit. And now he's come back as a computer virus. How did he go from an ancient evil entity to ashes on the ground to that? Doesn't matter. Society advanced a million years right after he died, making everything futuristic, so we needed a tech-themed villain. And if he's a virus, that means he can take over Ninjago again. The only difference is that this time, he uses his dark hacking powers to take control of an army of Nindroids instead of Stone Warriors. And for some added Season 1 pandering, their only weaknesses are for Technoblades that are golden for no particular reason in canon. But hold on, there's something missing to help round out this repetition of story elements with a new, slightly shinier paint job. Wait, I've got it. Let's bring back Pythor! You remember Pythor? We thought he died at the end of the first season? He's back, baby. New and improved with electric eels. <laughs> Where was he during the events of season two if he survived the Great Devourer? Who knows? I choose to imagine that he was lovingly waiting in a dark cave for the right time to strike. The name of that cave being the writer's asses. <gasps> and what's funny about his return is that before he's revealed, the writers do their damnedest to make it a mystery who he is. Like they give him a weapon, a cloak with a hoodie, a voice modifier. They're hopelessly trying to get you to think, OMG. I, I wonder who it could be. But it's fairly evident from the beginning. I would genuinely be shocked if anyone didn't pick up on it right away. But we've spent enough time talking about how stupid it is that they're back. Let's move on to how stupid their plan for evil world domination is. Because why wouldn't it be evil world domination? It's never not that. And in this case, it's predicated on stealing Lloyd's ultimate master powers to give the Overlord a body. One that he will then use to harness the golden weapons, which are on a meteor thanks to the time travel travel episode by turning them into an armor he can wear. And I realize I said that in a normal speaking voice, but that's just so I don't throw it out this early on in the recording process. Trust me, I fucking hate this decision, as it flawlessly summarizes what's so annoying about this season. It expects you to just accept whatever nonsensical shit it throws at you completely unprompted. We don't know why the good energy that destroyed the Overlord can be used to fashion him a body. It just works. We don't know why Lloyd's ultimate master powers don't work on Overlord's corrupted robots. They just don't. We don't know why the Overlord and ancient evil survived and came back as a computer virus. He just does so the plot can happen. Happen. And if we didn't allow all these nonsensical concessions, we wouldn't have all this juicy fan service in the form of returning villains. Oh, what we would have missed out on if a couple more basic questions were raised. But don't you worry your silly little heads. These force conflicts aren't limited to the villains. We've got them for the heroes too in the form of the least convincing love triangle in human history. See, I didn't bring it up before since it was such a minor yet overt part of the two's relationship. But in the first two seasons, Jay and Nia were all but confirmed to be a couple. They went on dates, they flirted, Jay's true potential episode ended by confirming they were in to each other, it wasn't a mystery what the show was going for, and with just how blatant it was, I assumed they just straight up gotten together by season two and we just didn't hear about it due to Nia being so absent, but nope. Apparently they decided to keep it up in the air. And in season three, they act on that lack of clarity by foregoing everything we've been led to believe, saying that Nia secretly might be into Cole. Uh, of course! It was staring us dead in the face all along the way Nia and Cole talked to each other that one time. Actually, I'm not sure if Nia and Cole have ever had a singular meaningful exchange over the past two seasons. I can't remember one time they directly spoke to each other outside of a group discussion. Whereas with Jay, I'd say about half of Nia's screen time has been dedicated to talking or hanging out with him, so... Yep, this is dumb. This is incredibly dumb. Neither Cole or Nia have shown any passionate affection for one another before now. So why in the fuck are we trying to pretend Jay and Nia isn't set in stone? Love triangles are almost always an annoying cliche shoved in to add artificial suspense to romance stories, but what makes them intriguing is the uncertainty. You want to see it through to the end to figure out who the protagonist chooses, rooting for one choice or the other over the course of a story. But no matter what kind of implications you give in this scenario, it's never not going to be obvious who she'll end up with. 
you can't just pretend Cole and Nia were a possibility and spend the whole season acting like it's a real tough choice for her. Don't piss on my head and tell me it's raining, guys. You're not building any suspense, and you can't trick the audience into believing this will go more than one way. Also, side note, this is slightly semi-related. I find it hilariously ironic that Nia, the character described as feeling left out and being independent, had her first major story that stays relevant for a full season be choosing the boy she's gonna date. Like, I'm not sure if Nia as a character is a result of the writers being just that clueless, or if it's some kind of inside joke between them, but either way, it's a pretty entertaining shit show that adds on to an already terrible conflict. It's also hilariously bad that it almost makes me forget the upsides of this season, and believe it or not, there are upsides. As I've made abundantly clear, this season is heavily flawed, there's no doubt about that, but as opposed to season 2, it does have a fair amount of good. The season's emphasis on a tech theme may have been ludicrous and forced, but on the positive side, it did lead to some decently fun settings to take the ninja, such as space, the digital world, a mechanized version of Ninjago City, so on. And we also got to see more of these settings than ever before, with Lloyd and Garmadon separated from the team, allowing both to get equal attention and importance to the plot on their own respective journeys. In a way, it's sort of an inverse of Season 2's abysmal character balancing, giving the ninja actual relevance again, and Lloyd a detailed, compelling story with his father that naturally adds depth to his character. It was honestly super surprising to me, as at first, I was skeptical how they could keep him and the story interesting when the end of the second season saw him gain ultimate power. That's often where a story will come to an end having reached its climax, so Lloyd going on another adventure with those powers sounds kind of boring in theory. However, they make it work by exploring the downsides of holding on to supreme power. What sacrifices have to be made to keep it, whether or not someone can handle the responsibility, if it's worth retaining now that so many people are looking to use it to harm others. It makes for this excellent ideological divide between Lloyd and Garmadon on the subject, as Garmadon fought a one-person battle to hold extraordinary power, so he believes it's worth protecting at all costs even if Lloyd has to carry that burden alone. But in the end, Lloyd decides it's better for him to share his power, getting rid of that threat and allowing the others to help cover for his weaknesses. It's all such a well-done conflict of opinions, as neither option is objectively wrong, but Lloyd Lloyd's choice in the matter says a lot about his character, and it's a decision that makes sense, as during his adventures with Garmadon, we get to see his weaknesses in action, how he can be overly reckless and irresponsible, letting his innocent kindness overtake logic. The journey leading up to this choice serves as a smart method for delivering characterization whilst giving credence to his eventual decision. It helps me understand who Lloyd is as a person far more than Season 2 ever did, and it's made greater by not overtaking the other ninja stories, allowing both to be fleshed out to their fullest potential. Er, I should say partially full potential, as a lot of the ninja screen time is the love triangle I talked about before, but on the upside, Zayn gets a not ungodly annoying romance with a new android pixel, and it's cute. There's not anything to stand out about how it's presented, but it's nice that Zayn can have a romance too, despite his, uh, circumstances. If you didn't catch that, I'm saying he doesn't have a penis. But while we're on the topic of Zayn, I feel like I should point out that his story isn't flawless, and by that, I mean the end of his arc? Question mark? Is same as season two, right out of nowhere, and awfully convenient. The major split between the two being that instead of gaining a power up out of nowhere like Lloyd, Zayn, with no build up to indicate he could do such a thing, sacrifices himself to the Overlord by. I think freezing him to death? And so, by virtue of this ending including a sacrifice, you're less likely to point out that it doesn't make sense, as you're so caught up in the emotion of it all. Thankfully I have a heart of stone, so I'll do it for you. This doesn't make sense. Like, what's the implication here? The Overlord, a being of pure evil that supposedly could only be defeated by pure good energy, was beaten by Zayn freezing him and blowing up? What? How does that work? 
why did it work? The closest thing to a justification given is that during his sacrifice, Zane remembers Pixel telling him he's special, but I'm not sure what relevance it has to the sacrifice. It's not as if Zane was struggling with his identity over the season, wondering what makes him distinct from the other Nindroids, and coming to an understanding that it's his will to protect others, culminating in a sacrifice representing all that he stands for and wants to protect. I just made that up on the spot. In canon, the sacrifice doesn't have so much as a chunk of that weight surrounding it, and so, rather than representing a revelation about Zane's rediscovery of who he is, mirroring season one, it comes off like a half-hearted excuse for why his special kamikaze attack beat the Overlord when Lloyd's ultimate ninja powers weren't enough before. But hey, who cares? It's implied Zane survived anyway, so who gives a shit? None of it mattered! No permanent consequences, baby! In all seriousness, the season is still leagues above season two, but Dear God, please stop with the callbacks and let this series move on to some fresh ideas. I'm begging you. Well, this isn't the most original concept I've ever heard of, but it'll do, and I'd be lying if I said I wasn't interested. It's a common trope that's been used many times before in action series, but tournament arcs are fantastic avenues for character development and creative battles or challenges. Plus, there's the additional fun of the cast facing off with criminals or cheaters that exploit the games in their favor. It's a format that's got plenty to offer in terms of entertainment and imagination, whether you're going for a newer approach or something safe. And when it comes to season four, I gotta say, at times, it does use the structure of a tournament arc to great effect. Unfortunately though, it's brought down by the show's continued reliance on annoying cliches and unexplained contrivances, even the basic setup being riddled with these kinds of issues. The whole thing's predicated on the notion of Zane is alive, but being held prisoner on the same island as a tournament with other elemental masters, so the ninja need to enter the tournament in the hopes they'll find him. But I'm not sure how I can accept that when, first of all, we still have no idea how Zane survived blowing up in Season 3. I know I previously alluded to it being a brainless last second decision to backpedal a supposed to be emotional death, but earnestly, how did this happen? At the end of Season 3, it's shown that he's... I'm not sure how to describe it. His consciousness was found to be alive in the systems of the Nindroid factory? But how did he do that? When did he do that? Where? Why? Did he plan to sacrifice himself and had a contingency ready all along? It seemed to be a last minute decision at the moment and we never saw or heard about him keeping a backup of his memories, so... Am I supposed to infer that his robot soul found a way to cross over into the next piece of machinery he could find? Did he ingest the robot equivalent of the revive revive fruit from One Piece, allowing him to drift to the next soulless mechanical appliance? Do robots have souls? These are questions that need to be answered. Okay, maybe not the soul one, but the others are valid. And it's not the only question this premise raises either. Disregarding everything about how his consciousness transferred to the Nindroid factory, it's said in season four that Zane rebuilt himself after revealing his presence to Pixel, which leads me to wondering, how did he and Pixel get captured without anybody noticing? Yeah, you'd expect for that basic question to be answered at some point, but it never is, not even through vague implications. Season 4 starts with the ninja split up after Zane's presumed death, so they can come back together after the villain Chen implies he took him, meaning they weren't aware of his revival before this moment. But how is that possible? We saw at the end of Season 3, that Zane had control of the Nindroid factory, so presumably he could rebuild himself fairly quickly. And in that time, it would have been easy for Pixel to go to the ninja and say, guys, Zane is alive and he's rebuilding a new body as we speak. But okay, to give this a bit of leeway, let's think on the presumption that Pixel waits to tell the ninja. She's just so in awe of Zane's resurrection that she stares at his rebuilding the entire time. This would mean that for Chen's goons to capture both of them before the ninja found out, they would have to strike a flawless, threading the needle, Olympic gold medal winning abduction right after Zane was rebuilt, but before Pixel could relay the news. This would also mean that Chen was not only able to predict that Zane survived his sacrifice, something that anyone other than Pixel feasibly shouldn't have known about, but his moronic staff were able to break into a heavily guarded factory to capture the two without anyone being the wiser for at least a couple months because I guess the super high-tech factory didn't have any goddamn security cameras. Why not? Why the fuck not? 
This makes no sense! It is illogical in every sense of the word. This isn't even taking into account that Chen's been banished to a desolate island for multiple decades, so how would he know anything about the ninja to begin with? And why does he wait months to tell the ninja that Zane is alive? And where have these other elemental masters been all along? And how did Chen know where to find all the elemental masters? But... If you want to choose not to think too hard about all of that, so you can focus on the tournament itself, fine. I've still got a load of bitching to direct the tournament for going on way longer than it should have. Uh, but, but Braxton, you said you like tournament arcs. Why are you mad that it goes on for a while? Isn't that getting more of what you want? Eh, yes and no. Under most circumstances, I wouldn't mind getting a long tournament arc. On the contrary, I love them. What I don't love is when they're artificially extended to keep stories from ending prematurely. And there is an exact point where this tournament should have ended, but it didn't. At first, it's a typical round-based contest with the ninja searching for clues and fighting characters with archetypal personalities. The speed guy is a fast talker, metal is slow-witted, shadow is creepy, you get the gist, it's not too unique, but it's simple fun that progresses as you'd expect it to. The situation quickly changes, though, after the ninja discover that Chen is stealing all the loser's elemental powers in secret. They don't know what he's taken them for, but it's all they need to know to understand this tournament is a setup. So they decide to tell the other contestants, who see that Chen is also unfairly cheating in fights to get certain results, and there. Theoretically, this should have been the point where everyone teamed up against Chen, kicked his ass, got back their friends, and left. He has been outed as a fraud that doesn't play fairly who is stealing everyone's abilities for a scheme. So from this point on, everyone should have seen that they were getting set up and revolted. But they don't do that for one reason. We're barely three episodes into a 10 episode season. So one way or another, the crew need this tournament to keep going to get across that threshold. Narratively speaking, they may have written themselves into a corner, but they can get back out of it with the right twist. So how's it gonna go? Did Chen bring all of them here under the pretense that he had one of their loved ones? So regardless of the situation, they need to play or else? Nope. Chen doesn't have to resort to blackmail at all. He just tells them that the elemental staff, with all the powers it's collected, will go to the winner of the tournament, and everyone fucking believes him. Are you shitting me? Him. Who should I give my trust to? The guys who've saved the world more than once, who were truthful about what Chen was doing, or the guy that got banished to an island for causing infighting during a war between humans and Serpentine, who showed himself to be untrustworthy by cheating and is currently collecting all of our abilities, previously in secret until he was outed, saying that he'll hand over unlimited power to the winner for no personal gain. I'm leaning towards the second option here. <laughs> Were these guys raised at the Garmadon School for believing absolute bullshit? I cannot mentally comprehend that people would be this stupid. And that goes double for the ninja, specifically Kai, whose lack of awareness in his story this season is jaw-dropping to watch. It's all gotta do with his relationship to a girl that can copy others' abilities named Skylar, who who, if you didn't pick up on it already, is so plainly going to be Chen's secret minion that switches sides for the sake of love, it hurts. Like, it is painful how quickly I realized this was going to be her character. And you know, if they weren't so blatant about it from her introduction, I might have been fooled into thinking this wasn't the direction they were going, but this show can't help itself. From her introduction, there's special attention put on her for looking mysterious and catching Kai's attention. She is cunning and devious and has an ability that would generally be used by someone wanting to trick or deceive. She intentionally conceals what she can do, so she's most likely got something to hide. And above all else, we can't forget that this is Ninjago, a series that uses cliches far too often for its own good. So chances are, if they were less conspicuous about it, I and most people with brains in their skulls probably could have sniffed it out anyway. Really, it was so unmistakable what twist they were going for, I thought for a second that maybe it was all a bait and switch, that perhaps I wasn't giving the writers enough credits, and they were gonna reveal she was secretive for other reasons unrelated to being a spy. However, that goodwill was thrown right out the window when the actual bait and switch shows up, who looks so cartoonishly evil and suspicious, there's no way it could be him. The writers wanna pretend they're slick, so they have the crew all debating who's working for Chen, like, man, it could be anyone, dude. Anyone. I'm guessing Shadow. Definitely not Skylar, though. We can trust her. But all it does 
does is dig the hole deeper. The more they say Skylar isn't a spy, the more I and everyone else should know she is. It doesn't matter if the gang holds a test to determine innocence that, once it comes down to Skylar and the bait and switch, he decides it's the ideal time just to run away just because. That's not gonna put anyone off the trail. Skylar is the least discreet, most boring twist villain character in existence, and they can't even be bothered to let the cast discover who she is in a clever way. You wanna know how they figure out she's the spy? She uses the powers of ice to accomplish an unnecessary task right in front of Kai, and he goes, Wait a minute. You can only copy the abilities of someone you touch. And Zane's been captive all season by Chen. <gasps> oh my god! The Shadow Guy's the spy! Okay, but joking aside, this is... The one thing she shouldn't have done to give away who she is. The, the, the one goddamn thing. But you know, Skylar, much like everyone else this season, is the dumbest character in existence, so I'm more shocked she made it this far before breaking her cover. After all, once the mystique is dropped, everything relating to who she is as a person goes back to being the daughter of Master Chen. So the fact she could keep it under wraps for as long as she did is highly impressive. Fantabulous job, dipshit. Now the rest of your arc can be about passively following your dad's order until thinking, wait, I don't want to do this anymore, and predictably betraying him. What a brilliant use of time. Too bad it wasn't better spent on Chin himself, who's one of the few redeeming elements this season. No, actually, that's underselling him. I love everything about Chin, and honestly, who wouldn't? He's a wacky little guy that's both smart and crazy, doing the most batshit insane stuff purely for the fun of it. There doesn't have to be anything too complicated about him, he's just a silly little dude that likes stirring up chaos for power, and by the end of the season, we learn he wants to be a fucking serpentine, that's all. He has three objectives in life. Push button, become snake, and mess with his former pupil Garmadon, who, through Chen, reaches a phenomenal conclusion to his own character arc of making up for his past sins, again confirming that Chen is the best and deserved to be the main villain. You see, starting from the end of Season 2 onward, having been purified of his evil, Garmadon wanted to make peace with his past mistakes, but he wasn't sure how. In Season 3, he became a sensei who chose to fight through avoidance, thinking the best way to atone was by swearing off violence, but in the end, that was just a super superficial change. It didn't extinguish the feeling of guilt lingering inside him. And that's exemplified in Season 4 when Chen, a character representing all his regrets, holds secrets over his head, knowing Garmadon is still afraid of letting people know. It's a situation where Garmadon is forced to confront the demons of his past or let them control him forever, choosing to atone and find peace by sacrificing himself taking the place of people he wronged in the past to let them defeat Chen, allowing both him and them to go with no regrets. And it doesn't end in a fake-out death, either. According to wikis, this is the permanent death of Garmadon, and it's a send-off that's understandable, selfless, powerful, and indicative of how much he's grown. In my mind, there's no fitter way that the character could have gone, or that this season could have concluded. A season that, to be blunt, was extremely frustrating and mediocre for the most part, but was elevated by this conclusion. Illusion, Chen, improved animation and jokes, an open ending that foreshadows a villain for once, and last but not least, it ends the love triangle. Holly fucking Luya. Huh. That was. A season of Lego Ninjago? Okay, look, it was competent at what it set out to do. That's more than I can say for a majority of these. It's just. I was sort of hoping for more after I kept hearing how universally beloved this is, and to its credit, I would say it's one of the best seasons, at least for the moment, but for each thing they did decently, all I could think about was how much potential they were wasting. I mean, technically speaking, I guess every other season had the potential to be good too, in a theoretical sense, but none of them come as close to being great as Season 5 does. Seasons 2 and 3 in particular were inherently dumb, and would have taken a lot more to make them work. Whereas Season 5 has the right prospects, they just aren't utilized to their fullest. In terms of plot, the whole thing's actually kind of similar to Season 4, choosing to remove one of the ninja from play, this time Lloyd, who's been possessed, so the others can go on an adventure to save him. A choice I was, at first, a fan of, as by Season 4, Lloyd had gotten very stale very quickly, and it was sort of bound to happen after he overcame basically every major problem in his life 
life. He'd grown past the negative influences of society, lived up to his destiny as the chosen one, took control of his powers and used them how he thought was best, reconciled with his mom, saved his dad from evil, found a new family. I I'm not mad at him for dealing with all of this, I'm just saying he's run out of issues to explore, and a character that doesn't have issues is defined by their personality, which Lloyd was shown to have in season 3, but I don't know. It feels like season 4 forgot those traits in favor of... Uh, nothing. I don't remember a single thing he did or said last season. He was narrative dead weight that lacked a definite purpose in the story, so from that perspective, I get why he was shelved. Having his body possessed and taken away means that, on one level, he's got a new purpose, being the goal the ninja are reaching for trying to get back, while on another, it means the writers don't have to deal with his flat Lego ass and can focus on the original four, who have just as much personality as always. That's why I started out liking the decision. I thought it was a nice nice change of pace to have him excluded from the story for a season 1 style ninja adventure. But as the season continued, I slowly went back on this opinion and saw that Lloyd's lack of importance was the first of several missed opportunities this season. Why did my opinion change exactly? Because of one character, the equally underwhelming antagonist who possesses Lloyd, Moro. Now, giving some background here, Moro, same as Chen, is a character from another's past, this time Wu, having been his first student with the elemental master of wind and an all-around talented ninja to boot. However, Wu made a mistake and led Moro to believe he'd become the green ninja, so when he didn't, he went crazy trying to prove himself and was never seen again, making him Wu's biggest regret. Think Tai Lung from Kung Fu Panda, but he died instead of going to prison and possessed the green ninja rather than fighting the dragon warrior. And really, that's all Moro is. Emo ghost Tai Lung. He doesn't stand out as a personality and he doesn't have nearly as good a dichotomy with Lloyd as Tai Lung does with Poe. Their one meaningful interaction to Together in the finale can be boiled down to Moro going, You have friends and I do not. That's why I'm superior and you're weak, Lloyd. I deserve to be the green ninja for that alone. To which Lloyd replies, No, Moro, it's the other way around. My friends make me stronger. That's why I am the green ninja. It's such a shallow exchange between characters that don't know each other giving unspecific arguments for why they deserve this coveted title. And that's when I realized this all could have been fixed if Lloyd were handled differently. You know how I said before that he becomes a stale character with nothing else to overcome? Well, this conflict with Moro would have been a great opportunity to take his character inward instead of upward. Stop fixating on him overcoming obstacles, examine what makes him who he is. Give us a chance to understand why he deserved to be the green ninja over Moro besides Bloodline. And I'm not talking about a generic answer like, being able to rely on friends. That's a applicable to all the ninja. I want to know what makes Lloyd special. That's what separates the good Chosen One stories from the bad. They have the protagonist prove why they deserve Chosen One status through their actions. Take Kung Fu Panda. That's a story where, though it's believed to exist, there is no Chosen One. Not definitively. The title of Dragon Warrior is just that. A title. It's the person and their attitude that make it special, and Tai Lung couldn't accept that. Now, obviously they can't go that specific route with Lloyd, as he's got literal Chosen One powers and he's engraved into a prophecy, but my point stands. We should get a legit answer for why he's worthy. Some type of logical explanation that's properly built up over time as Lloyd and Moro interact and learn more about each other's differences. But wait! Moro is controlling Lloyd's body for most of the show, so how can they have interactions before they separate? Two words. Inner conflict. During the season itself, we occasionally hear that Moro is internally fighting against Lloyd, keeping him from breaking the possession, but we don't see it, and we should. Remember that time Total Drama chose to portray D.I.D. through the character's various personas talking in his head? Why not do that? Except not terrible and offensive. Show us Lloyd's deeper subconscious as he fights to regain control. Give him an ongoing physical battle or mental discussion with Moro over their thoughts on what it means to be the Green Ninja. Allow us insight into their worldviews and where they differ. Could be how Wu decided to train them, who their parents were, the environment they grew up in, their outlooks on life. Just give us anything
anything to help describe what Lloyd has that Moro doesn't besides friends. There are so many opportunities to deepen their discussion or make the answer more powerful, but they're never taken. So Lloyd stays as two-dimensional as ever, Moro remains unremarkable, and their final confrontation could at best be described as... Yeah. This is what I mean when I say the series wastes its potential despite the pieces all being right there. It sets us up for greatness, gives us hints at possible deeper conflict, and by the end acts as if it created full arcs for the characters, but they never get explored as much as they should have been. That's how it is for Lloyd, that's how it is for Moro, that's how it is for the ninja! Oh yeah, I didn't forget about them. How could I when their story suffers from the same obvious issues I just listed? Or. Rather, those issues become obvious when you notice that it puts more attention on exploring one element than the other, leading to another shallow experience. See, on the surface, it's a narrative that seems to do exactly what I was asking be done with Lloyd and Moro's story, introducing ideas along the season that end up important later on. The ninja hear about a new form of spinjitsu that allows them to fly, but it takes some members longer to learn than others. We find out there are 16 connected realms in the universe, one of which is Moro's ghost ghost realm that appears as a giant ghost vagina in the final climax. There are various legendary items that end up creatively used in fights across the season. These are all fun additions to the lore that develop over time and open the world to new possibilities, but the story is still missing something. The character drama. Granted, it's not completely absent. After learning air jitsu from a ghost sensei, Cole turns into one, leading to an episode where he comes to terms with the transformation, but that's just it. The conflict lasts for an episode. What I'm saying the ninja story needs is a defined, season-long character arc for one or all of them, as the world building is nice and the fights are cool, but the ninja themselves don't grow. In fact, the team sorta of regresses by not addressing a change in their dynamic that I thought was was gonna be the setup for an arc. That being how the team handles Lloyd's absence as the leader they look to for guidance. And the reason I assume this was the start of a new arc for the cast is that, well, up to this season, I didn't think the ninja had a leader. They'd never come off as the kind of group that let one member permanently hold a position over the others. In certain situations, one character will lead, in another, they'll go off to do their own things. No one ninja had authority over the rest. They were equals, no matter how powerful one character might be. So I presume this new status quo of the ninja feeling directionless without Lloyd was the dawn of a new arc. One where they'd start out complacently letting Lloyd, as the strongest, carry the team for them, and with him gone, they'd need to remember how they operated before him, corresponding with their loss of elemental powers due to his possession. It's a situation that virtually puts them back at season 1, so that could have easily tied into an arc of the ninja having to rely on each other like they did Lloyd and the powers he ensured they had. It was all right there as an avenue for the story, almost like that was the plan they were gonna go with, but then they just… don't. Nothing comes of it. The notion that with Lloyd gone, their powers go too is only ever mentioned superficially as an inconvenience, and in regards to how the team's disrupted, it's solely brought up as a running gag about how each of the ninja take on the role of leader and fail miserably. A bit that comes off strange and forced, seeing as the ninja were a functioning team before Lloyd. And up to this season, there was no indication they couldn't work as equals. As I said, in earlier seasons, it felt like the ninja could handle themselves, whether they had someone guiding them or not. And so again, I thought this was going to be an intentional choice. That the ninja would think they need a leader to get anything done, when in reality, they're equals with diverse inputs and skills. So while one of them doesn't work as a leader, together, they can make up for each other's shortcomings, putting the same faith in each other that Lloyd did for them in Season 3. It would have been so thematically coherent and parallel to when Lloyd was without them, but second verse, same as the first, it doesn't get expanded. They drop any mention of the team being unorganized joke after each one takes a shot as leader, and it doesn't get brought up again until when else but the last episode, where there's a blink and you'll miss it throwaway line about how happy they are that Lloyd's back to be the boss. It's an ending that weirdly undermines the individual value of the team by saying they've got no idea what to do when Lloyd isn't around, going back to my point that the team feels like they've regressed. And it's made worse by how, emotionally speaking, we never get a full picture for how the possession 
is negatively affecting the ninja knowing Lloyd's in danger. I mean, sure, we know they all care for him in some capacity, that's to be expected of a found family like theirs, but what I'm saying is that, on an individual basis, this could have been a great season to flesh out why Lloyd is so important to each member of the team, not just as a leader, but as a friend. Up till now, we haven't gotten so much as a hint that any of the ninja have a special, personal relationship with Lloyd. So, this could have been the season to flesh that out. Why do they value him so much on an individual basis? How is the possibility of him being killed by this season's villain causing them turmoil? That would have been a suitable motive for why they're so disorganized without him. They're too worried to properly concentrate. It sure beats the ninja straight up being incompetent out of nowhere, and it would have expanded on their team dynamic dynamic in a way we haven't seen before. But this isn't an idealized situation, so that doesn't happen. Shit, we hardly know anything about how any of the ninja are taking the possession besides Kai, whose connection with Lloyd could have meant more if it wasn't so out of left field. At the start of the season, there's this insistence that Kai and Lloyd have a brotherly bond, so Kai feels obligated to protect him. And same as the rest of the season, it doesn't get properly paid off, but unlike the other concepts, its setup isn't great either. The idea of the two having a bond is somewhat interesting, but for us to realistically care about it, we'd need it to be well established first, and in this season, it isn't. Like the rest of the ninja, Kai wasn't all that personally close with Lloyd before the events of this season, so if you want us to believe the two are close before he's possessed, we'd need appropriate time for this to feel natural. Time that we don't have, as Lloyd gets possessed almost instantly, so their relationship ends up compacted into one or two lines in the first few minutes of the season, gaslighting us about how close Close they are. Don't worry, big shot. I'll watch over you from now on. No, we're a great team. Golly gee, Lloyd, it sure is cool that we're such close friends. You know it, Kai. I love you like a stepbrother. Mwah, mwah, mwah. Mwah, mwah, mwah. And that's all this quote unquote friendship amounts to, besides what else but another throwaway line in the finale. For real! There's no dissection of Kai's worry and stress over letting Lloyd down, feeling useless over being too weak to save him, no flashbacks to deepen their friendship that materialized out of thin air. Hell, with Moro, there could have been a dichotomy between him and Kai, as both wanted to be the green ninja but took the news that they weren't in opposite ways, Kai choosing to protect Lloyd and Moro aiming to replace him, commenting on what Kai could have become if he let his jealousy consume him. But no. Kai and Lloyd's relationship get zero development, Moro and Kai have zero meaningful interactions, and zero of these stories give characters worthwhile journeys aside from Nia, who doesn't get nearly as much screen time as she deserves considering all the shit she's had to put up with. Like, Nia's been warming the benches from day one, waiting for her moment to shine, but I gotta emphasize to you all, she gets completely shafted after the first season, which feels like a far-off memory to me at this point for how different it was. Back then, she still wasn't the top dog or anything, but she was active. She contributed to the story in some meaningful way, even if she wasn't the key figurehead. But then you look at her track record after season one, and it's a little embarrassing. You know what she does in season two? She gets kissed by doppelganger, Anger J, builds the cruise vehicles, and she gets turned evil. Doesn't break out the Samurai X suit? Once. Season 3? She debates whether to go out with Jay or Cole, fights a couple grunts in episode 3, then she busts out the Samurai X suit and gets KO'd instantly in the finale. Fucking instantly! Season 4, she tries to infiltrate Chen's base and gets found out after being stupid, so the ninja have to save her. Point is, she's continually drawn the short end of the stick, so finally giving her a significant story is huge for her character, but it comes with the downside that she doesn't get nearly enough focus, and the way they go about giving her relevance is super forced and dumb. Apparently, the staff couldn't see a version of the season where she helped as Samurai X, the identity she made to stand separately from the rest of the crew as her own person, so... In a very well thought out decision on her part, they decided to impose on her a new identity. One she couldn't choose to be. The daughter of the Master of Water. Shoehorning her into being a part of that same crew she chose not to be in. Okay, putting aside the fact that this move goes directly against her character and was blatantly a ploy at giving her relevance as ghosts the main enemy this season are weak to water... 
Can we talk about how bullshit this reveal is to begin with, seeing as for a while now, we've known that Wu sought out the original four from having met and fought alongside their parents back in the day. So that means he knew Nia's mom was the master of water, yet he chose to keep this information secret from her why? If you want an answer to that question outside the narrative, it's that this 100% wasn't the plan back when the series was starting out, but in the show, we get nothing besides he didn't think she was ready. A point that's dumb, since she seemed perfectly fine hearing that her father was the master of fire and wanted to be included from episode one. So I'm gonna have to call baloney on that, sensei. There is no defense for why you shouldn't have told her, you senile old fuck. But... On the other hand, if I'm being fair about the positives of this change, in addition to letting Nia be relevant, it does give her a chance to develop for the first time in over three seasons. For too long, she's had the simple moniker of tomboy inventor that plays by her own rules. It's about time we got to learn who she truly is apart from the archetype, and season five accomplishes this by, would you look at that, giving her a real flaw to overcome that relates back to a deeper person personal issue. More specifically, it looks beneath the facade of Nia having a myriad of skills by saying she's only so good at the things we've seen her do from having picked them up right away. She didn't struggle to understand what she's best at, so they've become her main interests, those being fighting and inventing. But during the time she's faced with an obstacle that she didn't overcome immediately, in this case waterbending, she gives up. That's so much more than we've ever gotten to hear about Nia's problems, and it really brings her full character into perspective giving us a journey that, despite its lack of screen time compared to the other ninja, is by far the most engaging. At its core, it may just be a typical, perseverance is important but you should loosen up moral, but nevertheless, I'm glad she got something. Her relationship with the new anti-hero Ronin was also nice. It was an unconventional relationship for sure, but it worked for what it was and helped in elevating her story. I'm just disappointed it didn't rub off onto the others, but overall, this was still one of the more consistent season so far. I didn't see nearly as many sudden rises or drops in quality as before, and when it could go all the way with a topic like Nia or the world building, it did well. Unfortunately, the same can't be said for a majority of the amazing setups it wastes, leading to a fairly decent but not exceptional main plot, and it doesn't ever reach the same kinds of highs as season 4, so I was ultimately less than satisfied. Huh. That started off positive, but then it just devolved into disappointment. Kinda like this video! I... um... I'm speechless. I think I've officially seen... the dumbest season of this show. No, 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 actually, I'm calling it right here. There's no way it could get any stupider. Th there's no way! We have reached the ceiling of doltishness, the pinnacle of thick-headed lunacy. Alexander the Dumb of Macadumia is weeping, having gazed at the horizon to see there are no more worlds of buffoonery to conquer. Oh, brainless triviality, thy name is Lego Ninjago Season 6, Skybound. This season is dumb, and for any of it to happen, the cast need to have a collective IQ of negative 13. But hey, if there's one thing I can compliment, they don't waste your time. From the very moment this season gets started, it's crystal clear how the rest of it's gonna pan out. Just take a look at the inciting incident. The way it opens is that Klaus, Chen's former sidekick turned vengeful spirit, unleashes a double-crossing pirate Jin named Nauticon, who, having been released from his lamp's prison, just so happens to have a grudge against the ninja. See, he's looking to get this item called the Realm Crystal that's under the ninja's protection, so he frames them for a bunch of crimes to get them out of the way, then he takes the crystal, gets his old crew back together, and goes back to his own realm. But unfortunately, it's kinda sorta already falling apart, and it's also the ninja's fault. It all goes back to how last season, during the big lore dump about the 16 realms, we heard about how they're all connected, and certain ones are affected by the others, and there are dire consequences for messing with them, blah blah blah. Main takeaway is, after Nia destroyed the ghost vagina, representing Moro's realm by getting it wet, Nauticon's realm was destroyed too, and as you can imagine, 
he isn't too happy about it. Thus, in this season, the ninja need to simultaneously stop him from destroying Ninjago to recreate his old realm, and prove their innocence to the public who've lost faith in them. And I'm not gonna lie, from a pitching standpoint, I like what they're going for. Any story featuring a cast of heroes perceived or framed as villains as a part of a bigger plot from the true antagonist is an instant plus in my book. It's part of why Alabasta is my favorite arc in One Piece, don't at me. When done well, this premise can make for stories that genuinely endear you to the cast, knowing they'd never do the things they're accused of, making it all the more satisfying once the true culprit is finally taken down. However, One Piece this is not, so although the concept itself is great, the execution turns it into the least plausible situation you could think of. You ever wonder why a story like Alabasta works so well? Because the antagonist knew how to manipulate the masses. He understood there was skepticism about the Kingdom of Alabasta from its citizens, and with the right push, it could cause a rebellion, so that's what he did. Crocodile used his vast wealth and position of power to manufacture an intricate web of lies, edging the rebellion closer and closer to war until it reached a breaking point. He exploited the mistrust of regular people to get his way, and that's part of why you hate him. His plan is so well done that if you were in the average citizen's shoes, you would have been fooled too. Something I can't say the same for about Ninjago Season 6, as by this point, you'd think the average Ninjago citizen would know better than to blindly believe that the ninja would turn evil and start causing destruction with no provocation. If we were in Season 2, it could have made sense. The ninja weren't established yet, so nobody knew who they were. They couldn't take down the Great Devourer and caused a lot of property damage, so they could be perceived as unreliable. And they worked with Garmadon, evil lord of destruction. So them turning out to be evil wouldn't be impossible. But we're not on Season 2. We're on Season 6, man. They've saved Ninjago on their own very publicly multiple times now. And in the cases it wasn't as public, their moments were documented and made known. They've literally got a museum dedicated to their achievements. Uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but once you reach museum about how rad you are status, I don't think it should be that easy for people to switch around and say, uh, I knew they were vandals. They just do what they want and think Ninjago's gonna take it. Like, come on, guys. Really? You're gonna fall for this? The ninja have fought armies of talking snakes from legend, an all-powerful walking stone army, demons, the embodiment of evil itself, robots, magic, and ghosts. But lookalikes, no way. It's gotta be the ninja. It's just like them to terrorize an amusement park and rob a bank. Bastards. And you gotta realize, it's not just the media or the police that think it's them. To an extent, you could excuse that as sensationalism and following orders as lawmen, but everyone is convinced it's them. Their fans, the people they've saved, their parents? No, seriously, their parents are reluctant to defend them when weird shit like this happens every other goddamn weekend. The 16 Realms thing is shown to be public knowledge. I get the writers want to explore the negative side of fame as an early theme of this season, but you've got to have some believability for this to work. There's got to be the slightest indication of common sense for it to function in any capacity, and we don't get it. Making the entire realm of Ninjago look like a bunch of halfwits. For fuck's sake, the only ones who come out looking dumber are the ninja themselves, who could have ended this stupid season in four episodes if they had five collective brain cells and weren't tricked so easily into wasting their wishes. Now, I hope I don't have to explain what a djinn, otherwise known as a genie, can do. I'd be genuinely surprised if you didn't know. Three wishes come from a lamp, etc, etc. You probably probably already know what I'm talking about, but something you might not be aware of is that about half the time in these types of stories, they're also con artists who like to trick their masters for not being explicit enough with their wishes. And Nautikon is no different. He loves messing with people whenever he can, and if possible, he attempts to force the master to wish it all away, trapping them into his sword. And I already know how that sounds, since most people wouldn't use the phrasing of I wish it all away, but you can just chalk that up to Nauticon being way too 
too skilled for his own good. He's like a master of deception. So the ninja need to find a way to beat him at his own game before he picks them off one by one. And it's hard because he's supposed to be so clever, no one can beat him on their own. He can always find a loophole to have the wish go in his favor or he'll get inside the characters' heads before they can find a solution. Basically, once you're alone with him, you're fucked. Even Zane, the most logical of the group, isn't immune to his tricks. So none of them have any ideas on how to beat him, but they know it's gotta be with a wish. So across the season, they are building up how ingenious it needs to be. They can't settle for any garden variety wish off the top of their heads. It needs to be the end-all be-all of wishes. The kind of third eye awakened, fourth dimensional chess move that makes Magnus Carlsen, Stephen Hawking, and the cast of Dragon Ball look like a bunch of amateurs by comparison. And this wish is needed more than ever by the finale, as everything has gone to shit. Lloyd is old, the pieces of Ninjago Nauticon raised in the sky are falling, Nia is dead, the ninja are at their lowest point in the season, so it's time for that magical bullseye going through another arrow's bullseye wish to blow us all away. God damn, it's so amazing, Jay doesn't realize he wished for it until it happens. And that wish is... I wish the lamp stayed missing and none of this ever happened. Okay, 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 no. No, not okay, not fucking okay. That was it? That was the galaxy-minded wish we were waiting for? <laughs> 10 episodes of Foundation wondering, gee, what are they gonna come up with? And they decided to close out this saga using baby's first time travel wish? Fuck you. That should have been the first thing they thought about wishing for. I definitely would have. Not that it's the only wish they could have made to stop him. There are dozens of moments over the course of the season that could have been turned around in an instant if the ninja thought about what they were wishing for for more than five seconds at a time. Off the top of my head, Nauticon tricks people into wishing for certain things by persuading them, so why not wish he didn't have a mouth? Then he couldn't talk shit or communicate to his crew. He's got a sword that captures people's souls? Oh, oh, well that's, that's rather difficult. Why don't you wish it was destroyed and the souls were returned or that Nauticon physically couldn't touch it? Jay is stuck on Nauticon's ship and constantly put through hell as he encourages him to wish it all away? All right, that situation is dumb on various levels, but why not wish to be off the ship? How about wishing for Nauticon's crew to hate him? Or if we want to get less inspired, let's just wish Nauticon was back in the lamp, or that he can't grant any more wishes, or send him to another dimension he can't return from. They never say you can't do that. Those are all viable options. It's the writer's faults for making the ability to wish way too open-ended as to what can be wished for. Yeah, in the beginning, we learn about the basic rules, can't wish for love, death, or more wishes, but as you hopefully picked up on, every single one of my suggestions went around them. This is why you shouldn't copy and paste elements from other stories into yours so casually. It's true that, on average, the three rules given are all that's necessary for an intriguing genie story, but I don't think those rules were written with fighting the genie in mind. It could have been fixed with a simple addendum saying, you can't make a wish against the genie, or genies are impervious to magic, but he isn't. I went and looked at the wiki for his character just to be sure I didn't miss any expository dialogue, and I am right. He doesn't get any exemptions for wishes, so there are several methods for taking him down that are never used. There had to be a line drawn somewhere to keep him from being taken down too easily. Otherwise, the rest of the cast looks moronic for not beating him faster. And if you're thinking of excusing it by saying the staff didn't change the rules to be more authentic to the myth of genies, First of all, that's an incredibly weak argument, but second and more importantly, that's not true, as they do change one aspect of the genie mythos that, in doing so, completely messes it up the necessary components of a wish giver. Like, if I were to ask you, who can make a wish in a genie story? You'd probably tell me, the guy that lets the genie out, or the guy that has the lamp. And you'd be correct, that's how it's supposed to work. But in Ninjago, it doesn't, and that's a problem. After all, one of the most compelling aspects of a genie story is the limitation that comes with the power. It's like a stranded island question. You've got three wishes, but you need to be careful. What are you wishing for? That driving question 
is what helps make any given genie story unique, as not every protagonist is going to wish for the same thing. And the fact that the wishes are so limited means they've got to be extra selective. But that's the thing with Nauticon. He doesn't need someone to rub his lamp or hold it or anything. He grants wishes to whoever's in earshot of him, prerequisites be damned. There's no bar for entry. Literally any random Joe off the street could see him, make three wishes, and he'd have to grant them. A rule that, when you think about it, makes the notion of just three wishes completely meaningless. There's even an almost self-aware moment where the ninjas start wishing more frequently, knowing that combined they've got like 15, but they don't realize the power these wishes have, so they end up wasting almost all of them on trivial shit to unintentional comedic effect. And it's right there, dude. The show is right on the edge of being self-aware about what they've done, but they couldn't get there. So it ends up being one of the most annoying moments in the series. And by the way, for clarity, I only say one of the most annoying moments, since the series finds a way to be more infuriating during the final climax, which seems to forget the very rules they made up so Jay can have a harder time beating Nauticon than if they were consistent. The way it's set up is that after all the ninja are captured, Jay is alone. And among the ninja, he's the last one with a wish remaining. So he gathers a bunch of B-list side characters to help him take everyone back, and there's a major emphasis put on how important Jay's wish is. And when I say that, I don't mean it like before. It's not merely the importance of the wish that's highlighted here, but the quantity. This is the ninja's last wish, so they need to make it count, and I'm not sure how you missed this, guys, but, um, why not use the B-team? That's how many? Six members who've had zero interactions with Nauticon, so that would be, what, 18 additional guaranteed wishes right there that they could use? I've said it once and I'll say it again, there's nothing stopping them from making a wish as long as Nauticon's in earshot, so why doesn't Jay take advantage of this and get them to all use their wishes less stupidly, having seen the ninja fail? Or fuck the team. Lord knows those morons are gonna run out of wishes again, asking for stupid shit like, a sword. So once those wishes run out, why not take volunteers off the streets? As long as Nauticon can hear them, they can make wishes, so boom! Infinite wish hack! This is why media relating to genies and wish givers are typically hyper-specific about their circumstances and how their stories play out. The genies from Aladdin are inherently tied to their lamps and can't grant wishes for themselves, so to outwit Jafar, who's greedy and clueless, they trick him into wishing he were a genie, trapping him in a lamp forever. Rumpelstiltskin and Dr. Facilier both grant wishes too, but they do one as opposed to three, so by the time the wisher realizes they've been tricked, it's already too late. These are examples of wish givers done correctly. The writers of these projects understood there needed to be context-sensitive rules for the wish givers' powers so they couldn't be abused or overcome by the protagonist before the film got started. That's the biggest pitfall that Ninjago Season 6 fell into. They lacked ground rules. Not a Nauticon's powers were too heavily underwritten in the hero's favor, but the season itself treats them as though they're at a disadvantage, so it all comes off incompetent and unsatisfying. A sentence I'd also use to describe the real-world message this season wants to push through wishes as a metaphor. That being, yada yada, you can't wish for things in your life to improve, yada yada, do it yourself, yada yada, we have the power to shape our destinies, yada yada, that wish that detrimentally weakened you was an illusion. It's a super tacked on moral that doesn't matter, and it isn't a great comparison, as it wasn't greed or laziness that led their wishes to fail, it was bad wording, but yeah, I thought I would mention it just to be thorough. And speaking of things I mentioned out of obligation, was there any good amongst the stupidity this season? Eh. Nia got to do shit again. It might have just been her talking about how she's literally never had control of her life from the beginning of the series and is sick of it, which is kind of funny, but it's fine. Jay is also nowhere near as annoying as usual, so that's cool. He's still one of my least favorite members of the core cast, but maybe he'll be more tolerable from here on out? That's nice. Uh, I don't got much. Moving on. Day of the Departed. Oh man, why does everything from Possession gotta end up so underwhelming? <sighs> So, as you might have guessed, this isn't a season. It's a 40-minute Halloween special meant to explain why Cole isn't a ghost in the seventh season after getting turned into one in the fifth. So, 
arguably its importance, eh, nonetheless, it's canon Ninjago content, so I should include it. Even if, much like Possession, I have more to say about what it could have been than what it ended up being. The plot is pretty simple. Following a bunch of villains from seasons past, coming back to fight the ninja on the Day of the Departed, thanks to the same Go Sensei that transformed Cole. As far as ideas for specials go, it isn't new, but as I've said numerous times, execution is the most important factor in deciding whether a concept works or not. That's what separates well-done legacy media that validates the cast growth by showing how far they've come against old antagonists from, well, Day of the Departed. A shallow, fanservice-heavy mini-movie that cares more about fitting in dozens of references over having any semblance of story or depth. What, you thought this would be anything other than a series of short, anticlimactic, basic-ass one-on-one fights with no tension to speak of? Or I guess that's not totally true. I shouldn't forget the emotional climax of this where Pythor, <laughs> that monster, has a rock fall on Lloyd, and he stops it. The emotions are real! I didn't expect much from this, so I wasn't all that disappointed, but if this were made into a mini-season or given a feature runtime, they could have done way more with it than Lonely Guy Wants to Be Remembered, so Ghost Villains. I could take it or leave it. Uh, man, I don't know what to say. That was... Well, to put it lightly, for the first time so far in this video, I kinda don't want to talk about the season. Not like it's exceptionally bad or whatever, this is just... not anything. It's so fucking boring and monotonous, I'd probably have barely remembered a single thing about it if I wasn't taking notes. From what I've heard, this season was made in a hurry to put out some Ninjago content after the theatrical film got delayed, and if that's the case, it absolutely shows. This is not a story that warranted a full season, and they hardly try to fill it. It's actually got the opposite problem the Day of the Departed had, feeling like a premise that should go for three episodes stretched to fill a ten-episode season, resulting in a weak plot, barely fleshed out new additions to the lore, no character arcs, downgraded animation, bad pacing, and I don't know if I was the only one, but with a name like Hands of Time, I was severely disappointed to learn there was barely any time travel until the end. Undoubtedly, it would have been a huge logistical nightmare if the season 2 episode is anything to go by, but that could have been fun in how stupidly absurd it was. It would have been more enjoyable than this hodgepodge of miscellaneous elements taken from earlier seasons, but done as blandly as they could. And I mean it when I say this show doesn't have an original bone in its body. Like in Season 1, we get a new variant of the Serpentine called Vermilions that, as direct offspring of the Great Devourer, are small but come together to form sentient beings. You'd think this would be a cool idea rife for creative potential, but it gets old fast, and outside of coming together to make a bigger guy, they haven't got any abilities or fun personalities. There are also no other variants, unlike the regular Serpentine, so it's just the same trick of of them coming back together after being destroyed, repeated constantly over the course of 10 episodes. Thankfully, they aren't the main antagonist being backup for the real villains, the Time Brothers, Acronix, and Crux, but then again, they aren't much better, as they come from another overused cliché that Ninjago has severely outstayed the welcome of, the suppressed evildoers from long ago that Master Wu conveniently didn't tell the ninja about until this very moment. First it was the Serpentine, who he helped lock away, then Chen, the guy he banished to a distant island, then Moro, the student that walked out on him and was never seen again, now it's the Time Brothers he thought would stay stuck in a vortex after their powers were transferred to MacGuffin Blades. Really, at this point, Point, Wu should go ahead and make a list of all the villains he's banished, just in case Glup Shido, elemental master of doo, -doo feces, feces, returns to take back the title of Brown Ninja from Dareth by manipulating the shit out of their anal cavity. I'm just saying. A heads up for the ninja would be nice so they don't have to go through the same process of shock and confusion every single time this happens. Not that Crux and Acronix are all that unpredictable among villains the ninja thought. As I mentioned, they're an incredibly overdone trope, and all they've got going for them, aside from how they're searching for the blades holding their time powers is that one's old and the other is young, so occasionally there are jokes about that. 
Oh, and they're the ones who kidnapped Kai and Nia's parents back when they were young, but that's a whole nother frustrating can of worms entirely. I almost don't want to mention it since it was such a letdown for a question we've been waiting to get answered from the beginning of the series. Going as far back as the pilot, it's been a bit of a mystery where the siblings' parents went, especially after learning they were elemental masters. So, as time went by, it led to a rise in anticipation, hoping we'd get an answer. And the show hadn't forgotten either. As late as Season 4, we were getting teases about there being more to the disappearance appearance than met the eye. So the staff definitely intended to resolve it at some point, but now that we've got an answer, I wish we hadn't. It's like when they keep a monster in a horror movie hidden until the end, but when we see it, it's not scary at all. If you couldn't go bigger than the fear generated by not knowing what it looked like, then you never should have revealed it to us at all. And it's just as applicable to intrigue for the parents' disappearance. If you couldn't make the reveal live up to how invested people were in knowing what happened, you shouldn't have told us at all. A continued mystery left up to interpretation would have been a hundred times less disappointing than the answer they came up with. That being that when Kai and Nia were children, Crux threatened to hurt them if the parents didn't do his bidding, so they complied. This means that for the past 15 years they've been gone, they were just off in a shed somewhere building armor for the Vermilion. And I gotta tell you, that's a stupid twist that makes no sense. Crux had no leverage when he found the parents and threatened them. He didn't have an army at the time, and his elemental powers had been stripped from him. He was pretty much a normal guy. Meanwhile, the parents both presumably still had their elemental powers, and they were skilled fighters. There was no reason for them to be afraid. They should have been able to beat his ass and throw him in jail right there on the spot. But oh, I forgot. He pulls out a regular ass sword against two blacksmiths, surrounded by weapons they forged. They're at a clear tactical disadvantage. Seriously though, they put up zero resistance after he makes a totally baseless threat, assuming they have no other choice. And you know, on some level, I could have forgiven that if the reunion between Kai, Nia, and the parents was well done and meaningful. I would have been good if it ended on a satisfying conclusion that gave closure to this whole thing. But admittedly, it's hard for me to say if it was done well or not, seeing as they barely talked to each other outside of exposition. Position. And look, I understand they wouldn't exactly hit it off from the beginning. The parents were gone for the majority of Kai and Nia's lives, so naturally, they wouldn't know much about each other or how to interact. But I thought that was what this story was leading up to. That once Kai and Nia found their parents after hearing rumors, they'd be able to decide for themselves if they were true or not. But they meet each other in episode 8, and for a majority of the season after, Kai and Nia are cut off from the rest of the group. So there's no time for them and the parents to bond over anything. Shit, I don't even remember the parents' names. That's why I've been referring to them as the parents. They end up leaving that little of an impact by the time the season's over, after letting us wait six and a half years to meet them. And what sucks is that it didn't have to be that way. We could have had plenty of time to expand on the family's relationship if either one, they cut out some of the filler this season had, trust me, there's a lot they could get rid of and not have it matter at all, or two, for simplicity's sake, have the season center around Kai and Nia searching for their parents instead of making it one story among a sea of tedious side plots that end up going nowhere. I can vaguely get the angle the new writers were going for with this approach, trying to go back to basics like in one, but what separated one from this is that it knew how to space out character developments and give the cast room to breathe. You never felt like you were missing anything during the first season, but here, all the arcs start and end so quickly, mostly without proper resolution, it's as if this season was entirely unplanned. And it was, but still, they didn't have to make it that obvious. They didn't have to give five characters their own stories, almost all of which go nowhere due to the season's bad time management. I swear, it's so jarring that the season has such a large amount of runtime where nothing happens, yet it feels bloated and unfinished at the same time. I don't know how you fail that spectacularly, but on the bright side, I'll tell you this much. If it did do something right, it helped me appreciate the old writers, as they pull a lot of bullshit and can be super inconsistent, but they're memorable, and they don't write dialogue like a fifth grader, an issue this season had a major problem with. It might not objectively be the worst at everything, but I'll gladly take a bad show over a bland one, and this is by far the least fun I've had. I don't care if it's good, just please, next season, be interesting. 
Whoa, ho, ho. talk about getting more than I asked for. This season gives me so much to talk about, it's insane. Even the behind the scenes story for why it's so different is fascinating, having been directly influenced by the release of the theatrical film. Which is funny when you realize the film has nothing to do with the show. That's why I haven't brought it up till now. Besides characters and location names, they have nothing in common, so I didn't think it would even be relevant, but lo and behold, by virtue of being popular, relatively speaking, it caused a ripple effect on so much of what season 8 turned out to be, and it was all for the better. For instance, as you can see, the series got a massive upgrade in the visual department, giving the world finer details, a more intentional usage of effects and lighting, and new character models to match the films. Lloyd specifically also has a new male voice actor, so for once, he actually sounds like a teenager. And of course, I couldn't go without mentioning the film's biggest impact on the series, it revitalized interest in Garmadon through making him the movie antagonist, fundamentally shifting how this season was planned to go. According to the creators, before the film released, season 8 was gonna be a direct continuation from Hands of Time that thank fuck we didn't get, but the crew were asked to shift the focus to Garmadon for the reason that, plain and simple, LEGO wanted the series to match up more with the movie so new fans wouldn't be as confused. A pointless goal when you realize that, to reiterate, the film and show are nothing alike. None of the characters act like they do in the show, none of their relationships are the same, the setting is different. It's a totally self-contained story that doesn't try to mimic any element of the series. And to be fair, could you blame them? It's not like they could make the film a direct sequel to the series. There'd be too much lore to keep up with for casual viewers. It was in the filmmaker's best interest to go for something new. So it's kind of futile trying to make one resemble the other if you're asking me, but nonetheless, with the orders from Lego, time twins are out, Garmadon is in. So, to make up for the fact that he's, you know, long dead, this season follows a cult of his followers, the Sons of Garmadon, who want to resurrect him. An idea I initially thought sounded terrible, as Garmadon's sacrifice was one of the most meaningful moments in the series, and for them to potentially revoke that sacrifice by bringing him back... I don't think there's a fitting term for how much of a slap to the face that would be for viewers. It would have destroyed any goodwill I had left for the series if it were done as I imagined. And I don't know how to say this, but... Season 8 is so improved from the rest of the series, it's almost criminal, and it utterly blindsided me by handling the topic of Garmadon incredibly well. Like, what were they cooking with? Can I have some? Okay, I'm gonna back up for a second, but... Wow. This... This completely shattered my preconceptions and then some. I'm not sure if my low expectations led to a better experience than I would have had otherwise, but however it happened, I am shooketh to my core, and I mean that in the best possible way. This may be the first time in the whole series they've been so self-aware of the implications a decision would have on the story. As like I said, a cut and dry resurrection for Garmadon would be a narrative train wreck, but practically speaking, it wouldn't accomplish what the Sons of Garmadon are looking for either. They want the guy that had evil coursing through his veins, wreaking havoc and showing no mercy. Not the kind, introspective man looking to correct his sins. And it seems they know that's what they'd get in a regular revival, so they go for another plan entirely. One that not only works to bring Garmadon back without forsaking his character growth, but helps characterize the villains as truly despicable and self-interested despite claiming they want to help Ninjago. See, as a part of this new season, we get to learn a ton of new lore surrounding Lloyd's grandfather, the first Benjutsu Master. He came from the first realm out of 16 that ever existed, he created Ninjago in his image, and he chose to leave his realm after not taking sides in a war between dragons and onis, as he was a child of both. Not sure how the logistics work on that, unless it was a donkey and dragon situation where you're not supposed to think about it. But the takeaway is, he couldn't choose one or the other, so he used their powers of creation and destruction to forge Ninjago out of nothing. As you can imagine though, the Sons of Garmadon aren't interested in peace or love or any of that gay shit. They want destruction. So their plan is to resurrect Garmadon's evil half and nothing else, essentially stripping him of his person to create a version willing to use his own powers, and I love this. I think it's a genius workaround with almost none of the downsides a regular resurrection would have. At worst, you could argue it makes Garmadon too close to the Overlord, simplifying his character to a point of cliché and devaluing his growth, but you're wrong. You piece of shit. To the contrary, I'd argue that Garmadon in this season is what the Overlord should have been from the beginning. 
After all, it wasn't the concept of an evil being bent on destruction that made the Overlord unappealing. It's that he didn't have anything else. He was the most overdone, weakly motivated, evil mastermind villain I've ever seen. He's literally so cookie cutter he has a line in the finale of season 2 that goes, It's over. Evil wins. And that's how I'd sum him up as a character. He isn't. He is the embodiment of evil, and that just so happens to be incredibly boring. But Garmadon? <laughs> He's built differently. He brings a new meaning to the definition of pure evil by not being there mentally. The pussy overlord was a being that consciously chose to do evil. He wasn't compelled to do shit. But for this freshly revived Garmadon, it's more of an instinct driven by pure emotion. He's lost any semblance of his humanity there's no indication of proper thought or morality. It's more primal and animalistic, lacking any of the restraint or composure Garmadon once had. In fact, it's everything he tried so hard to suppress becoming. This revived well, I'd hardly call it a revival, this zombie-esque puppet mastering goes way beyond resurrecting Garmadon seeking his leadership. It's actively spitting on the grave of the person he truly was, bringing him back explicitly for the side he so desperately didn't want to be defined by. And what makes it better, or worse, depending on how you want to look at it, is that he isn't the main villain of the season. He's a pawn servicing the interests of the real antagonist, Harumi, who, much like Garmadon, is so much more than I ever imagined her character would be. Considering she's introduced as a sweet love interest for Lloyd with a secret dark side, I thought it was leading to another Skylar situation, where, in a twist of fate, she's working for an evil individual but goes back on it for love. And to say the least, I'm so fucking happy to have been proven wrong. There's no way I could have handled another Skylar, as she wasn't just cliche and obvious, she was totally forgettable as a character and insignificant for how much attention she got before the reveal. I mean, looking back, season 4 was hyping her up so hard, I almost assumed she'd be the real mastermind to be a little less predictable. But no, it goes in the exact direction you expect it to. And after Skylar reveals her true intentions, she has almost no personality or drive to speak of. She's a passive observer with no motivation of her own, purely driven by following her dad's orders until she goes, wait, I don't want to do this anymore. And then she did nothing else of importance for the rest of the series, since she didn't have anything to offer after season four ended. Really, with her ability, she was more of a plot device than a character, and I was ready to put Harumi in the same boat of cliche. In the beginning, she had all these generic Disney princess traits, like feeding to the poor and sharing struggles with Lloyd. It seemed undeniable they were setting her up as this tragically abused girl forced into a bad position. But then the strangest thing happened. It turned out to be an intentional ploy by Harumi to fool Lloyd and by extension the audience into a false sense of security so she could rip his heart out with a betrayal when he least expected it. Like, I genuinely need to highlight that. The writers of Ninjago, for the first time since season one, flawlessly executed a twist that played on viewer expectations about the series itself to trick them. It's almost as if all of the bullshit I've gone through was, in its own way, doing exactly what Harumi did, lulling me into a comfortable numbness only to pull the rug out from underneath, revealing something I never could have expected. And the thing is, unlike Skylar, they don't try to hide that Harumi isn't who she says she is. There aren't any, duh, I think we can trust her, moments to ruin the intrigue. The writers leave clues and let you figure it out by yourself if you notice, respecting viewer intelligence and rewarding anyone that gets it early. That's how a mystery should work. It's such a mark of growth from season four, I can't tell you how happy it makes me. And for a final positive comparison to Skylar, once Harumi drops the act, she isn't just a passive subordinate, she is the founder of the SOG and one of the most unique villains this series has ever seen. How so? Well, to me, she was the first antagonist I genuinely felt angry and contemptful at, a feat that I never thought this series would accomplish. 
accomplish. There have been attempts, sure, we've had dastardly, conniving assholes like Overlord and Chen and Nauticon, but none of them give off the energy where you don't just want to see them defeated, you need to watch them fail in the most embarrassing, pants shitting in front of the class way possible. They have to be a character so vile that when you see them do bad, it makes you want to say, they can't keep getting away with this. And what separates her from other antagonists to get that reaction is how personal all of her villainy is. But I don't mean that in the sort of, we fought a battle a million years ago, now I'm back for revenge kind of way. That's been done multiple times so far, and the revenge always amounts to, let's beat him up in a fight and take over the world, or let's destroy the world and the ninja with it. It could come from a personal motivation, but the act of revenge itself hardly tries to hit the heroes on a personal level. That's what Harumi does. She's got a similar goal in mind to the others, wanting to take over with Garmadon as a new ruler, but she goes about achieving it by just full-on mentally eviscerating the ninja, especially Lloyd, and it is all very personal. You see, Harumi's backstory is that her family was killed by the Great Devourer when she was a kid, and so from that moment forward, she spent her life planning to get back at the ninja for not beating it when Garmadon could. That's what drives her every decision. She's fueled by hatred for the group, blaming them for her suffering, and chooses to take it out on Lloyd as a martyr for her revenge. Every shallow relationship moment of the two connecting was a ruse to let her get closer and jab the knife in deeper. The resurrection is partially done to taint the memory of Garmadon that Lloyd had, emotionally breaking him when he can't fix his dad the same way he did several seasons ago. She has this husk of his father almost kill Lloyd with no remorse in front of a stunned audience, simultaneously breaking his spirit and everyone's faith in him as the Green Ninja. She takes a genuine shot at killing his family right in front of him so he'll have no one in this world he can go to. There aren't any quippy one-liners or goofy aspects of her character to help lighten the mood. She isn't a cartoony, over-the-top mustache twirler. Harumi is a crazed, spiteful psychopath out to systematically bring Lloyd down to her level, no matter what it takes. Memes aside, I'd compare her to Joker in Batman the Killing Joke, trying to prove that anyone could become her with the wrong circumstances. Effectively, she wants to justify her own hatred that, ironically, in contrast to her savior, Garmin, she's chosen to define herself by. Harumi's character is one seeped in tragedy and misguided praise not for Garmadon the person, but Garmadon the idea she uses to justify her actions. She's enamored with this idolized view of the ruthless dark hero that did what the light never could. She seemingly models herself after this principle, and yet she can only recreate that version of him through removing his person, implying that at the end of the day, Harumi doesn't actually care about Garmadon. She cares about having her feelings validated, and Garmadon is nothing more than a tool for her to do it while enacting her vengeance. It's a big factor in why I can believe her motivations for hating Lloyd and the Ninja, despite it not being fair to them or all that logical. If you think about it critically, the Ninja didn't kill her parents or destroy her life it was the Great Devourer. Realistically, that should be where she directs her hatred, but from Harumi's perspective, as someone that once idolized the ninja for their strength, she saw her parents' death as them failing her, so she shifted the blame onto them for not living up to her expectations, and after letting grief consume her, she subsequently blamed them for her hatred. It's not my fault if I have to do all of this, it's the ninja. Everything I do is righteous, since I'm just giving Lloyd a taste of what I had to go through for his failure. This is the kind of reasoning Harumi Rumi uses to make sense of her actions, and it's a brilliant method for demonstrating how far gone, selfish, and manipulative she truly is. I don't think anyone can argue that what Harumi went through as a kid was incredibly traumatic. It could mess up anyone at that age, and it's no wonder she sees it as the moment that changed her life but it's not a justification for the monstrous things she does, and deep down, she seems to know. That's why she has to be a perpetual victim to the irresponsible ninja. That's why Garmadon has to be the new ruler to make Ninjago safe. That's why Lloyd needs to fall to his knees and give in to despair the same way Harumi did. She wants her mindless aggression and blind resentment, the very trait she instills Garmadon with in his resurrection, to be proven right so she can know that what she's done wasn't immoral. It's something anyone in her position would have done when brought to the brink of mental collapse. But Lloyd doesn't give in. Even after he thinks he's lost his family, even after he's been defeated and believes everything that he once had has been taken from him, 
he persists. He holds on to his optimism and belief that there's a better tomorrow for those who seek it, embodying everything Harumi isn't and exemplifying her deepest fear, that she's wrong. It's an amazing final moment of resistance that leaves you wondering what'll happen to her character now that, by all accounts, she's won. The ninja get teleported to another realm, Lloyd loses his powers, Garmadon has been resurrected, the sons of Garmadon rule the streets. It's a total success by every metric, but in that victory, she's setting herself up for destruction. And apart from her, this moment equally shows how well characterized Lloyd has become as her opposites. To be honest, in that regard, he's sort of taken a backseat to develop her character more than the other way around, and with how compelling she is, that's understandable. Harumi deserves to be the star here, so I don't blame the shift in priorities at all. But giving Lloyd some credit here, the season uses him amazingly as well, and through his relationship with Harumi, makes him captivating again for the first time in four full seasons. Like, I mentioned it back in the Season 5 review, but starting from Season 4 onward, Lloyd has been written as such a boring character with nothing to provide the cast other than being the de facto leader. He's not wise like Wu, an annoying jokester like Jay, hot-headed like Kai, responsible like Cole, stoic like Zane, or a girl like Nia. He's just one of the guys who happens to be the leader slash chosen one. And that seriously annoyed me, as he had a character in those early years. And with this season, it feels like the writers wanted to make up for that discrepancy after years of neglect. It's as if they woke up from a coma, saw how far gone his character had become, and decided to make Lloyd the most charming he's ever been by remembering his roots. He isn't the dull, non-denominational, Big Bang Theory-enjoying ambiguous leader. He's the innocent, naive, trusting one that sympathizes the most with others and won't ever give up on looking for the best solution. It's a personality that made so much sense for his character as a forgotten kid that was literally aged up, missing out on his childhood. Mentally speaking, he was still an 11-year-old burdened with more responsibility than most adults, so his early struggles were about learning control and how to handle the obligations handed to him while staying true to the person he wanted to be. That's the character Lloyd was. And season 8 doesn't just recognize that, it pushes his idealism to the edge of a fucking cliff. He's put through absolute hell from start to finish to help re-establish and strengthen all that he stands for, and it endears me to him in a way that I've never considered before. It's the first time I've felt he earned the monikers of Chosen One and Leader, as it gives him an unshakable resolve and philosophy towards people that, for once, made me understand why he deserved to lead, why he's worthy of being the Chosen Savior. It's such amazing writing that, retroactively, it improves earlier seasons whether this was the original intent or not. I haven't seen this much of a glow up for any other characters ever in this series. So my only hope is that with this new wave of writing, they'll embolden other members of the cast that got less attention this season too. Don't get me wrong, this isn't a complaint. If my long-winded rambling didn't get the point across, there's a lot going on this season. And the cast dynamic isn't nearly as off as in, say, season two. The ninja are plenty relevant to the plot this season, and they're important pillars for Lloyd's sanity as all of this crazy shit is going down. I'm just hoping they get some of the same development now that the writing has gotten so strong across the board. Maybe not immediately, as this season does end on a cliffhanger, so Lloyd, Harumi, and Garbodon's story still needs to be completed first, but, you know, in time. All you need to understand is that I love this season, I love what it does for Lloyd, and I want the same for the other characters if we get the chance. It's a story that left me on the edge of my seat anticipating what'll come next, so all I can ask for is that they keep it up. <laughs> Guys, I'm not a religious man, but to whatever god or deity or alien creature who may or may not be named Xenu is out there, I want to tell you, thank you. Thank you for not letting Sons of Garmadon be a fluke. You all have no idea how much I was stressing about if Season 9 dropped the ball. I was afraid to keep going with this video out of a fear that it might be shit, but it wasn't. Oh dear fucking lord, it was not a letdown. I'm not sure I'd put it on quite the same pedestal, as Season 8 starts slow and gets phenomenal, whereas this is at a consistent level of pretty good, but regardless of how it stacks up to Sons of Garmadon, 
Hunted is very much its own thing and amazingly builds on the foundation Season 8 left behind. Take Lloyd's story, for example. As I predicted, it continues his struggle to overcome Harumi and Garmadon, but aside from being just as engaging, everything else about this situation and how his character arc goes is intentionally in stark contrast to what came before. In Season 8, he's confident, open, strong, has all his friends to back him up, and everyone believes in him. He's living his best life. Fast forward to the start of 9, all of it's gone. He's lost his confidence, doesn't know if he'll ever trust anyone again, his powers have been taken from him, all the ninja other than Nia have been teleported to the first realm, and after Garmadon's brutal victory over Lloyd, the people's spirits have been broken. In other words, it's the perfect spot for him to rise again. And in doing so, it gives some perspective on what Season 8 was trying to set up, slightly changing how you view it in hindsight. As I was watching the Lloyd bitch slapping unfold in the moment, his constant testing came off like I said before, a reminder of who he is, not letting himself succumb to darkness, and a sick reminder for Harumi that she went down the path she did voluntarily. However, now that I've gotten to Season 9 and see the new role he's being trained to fill, it's become clear that for Lloyd, Season 8, more than anything, was a deconstruction of his character. A scenario to break down his youthful innocence, making him question certain aspects of his beliefs and reflect so that, once we get here, he can start rebuilding the pieces as a true leader beyond the Green Ninja title, setting this season apart as the climax of Lloyd's growth. For years, we've gotten stories about him coming into his own, being a master in training, and those are all fine for what they do, but none of them have challenged him to fundamentally alter how he thinks or acts. When faced with obstacles in the past, he's adopted little lessons, like teamwork comes from respect, and you should know when to rely on your friends. Things that are important to know as a leader, definitely, but ultimately, things that can only take him so far without changing his outlook on leadership itself. Not that he needs to become a totally new character, the season makes it clear he shouldn't lose the traits that make up who he is, but for the longest time, when all was said and done, he was never put into a situation so dire, it forced him to change his thoughts on being a leader like Season 9 does. In this situation, he has none of what he once had. A trained team, his green ninja powers, a voice that people can trust, all the things he believes are necessary components of a leader that, in one way or another, were sort of handed to him. His team and powers were the result of a prophecy. His trust from the people was earned through using those powers to defeat evil. In that sense, it could be argued that before Season 9, Lloyd wasn't in a position where he was truly worthy of the legendary status he was given. Personally speaking, he may have a viewpoint that's earned him the respect of the ninja, but his respect from the public as a symbol was dependent on his Chosen One abilities, not the person he was behind the mask. The way I see it, that's part Part of why Harumi turned on Lloyd so quickly as a kid after the Devourer attacked. She saw him and the ninja as trustworthy solely for the power they used to protect others. So when they failed to protect her parents, not having the strength she relied on to save them, Harumi turned her attention to Garmadon, the one who was powerful enough to defeat what the ninja couldn't, making him automatically the most trustworthy in her eyes. That's why she has Garmadon defeat Lloyd over a live broadcast to all of Ninja. She knew people trusted the ninja for the same reason she did, so by breaking that perception, similar to taking away all that Lloyd treasures, she hoped to give others the same feeling she felt when her life came tumbling down. The people of Ninjago didn't have a proper role model to base their trust on, so through losing everything they once admired about him, Lloyd strives to replace it with a more permanent admiration by becoming a true leader. A wise, charismatic figure that can inspire hope in others through his words just as much as his actions, not allowing his kind nature to keep him from making the right decisions. He becomes the exact breed of hero Harumi said he could never be, and yet, Lloyd doesn't have to give up on his positive outlook or convictions to do so. This is demonstrated when, in his fight with Garmadon, he resists through avoidance, taking away his control over the situation and returning it to himself along with his powers. Plus, I'm not sure if it's intentional, but the style of fighting 
fighting he uses matches exactly with how Garmadon chose to fight in Season 3. So in a way, he's fighting the evil side of his father by spiritually channeling the true side of him. My god, this season gives Lloyd more development and definition than the rest of the series combined, and he does it all alongside once unimportant side characters, who all get their own moments to shine like they never have before. You wouldn't expect Dareth or Mistake to be anything other than joke characters, but they provide new points of view that Wu and the regular ninja couldn't have given. It's a surprisingly nuanced use of the characters that wouldn't have been possible if the ninja were there. Though speaking of, they've got an awesome story of their own in the first realm that's kick-ass in a familiar but fresh presentation. Of course, on the obvious side, it gives us a cool new setting, putting the crew in this Mad Max-inspired world of dragon hunters with a little foreshadowing about the Oni for next season, but there's far more to appreciate past the basic stuff. Personally, what I find most creative about it is how the story featuring the ninja and a rapidly aging Wu uses its weird premise to lovingly recontextualize their relationship. Oh, right, for context here, back in Season 7, Wu sacrificed himself to keep the time bro stuck in a vortex, and in the process, he got hit with a blade that reverses things, leading to him becoming a baby. The gang then discovered Wu near the start of Season 8 as the effects were wearing off, so over the course of the arc, he slowly grows back up and this story centers around the implications of that process. The fact I said that so nonchalantly should say a lot about what I've been through, but hey, credit where credit's due, it's a plot point that's used really well by turning the process of Wu rapidly aging into a slideshow of his life letting us see how he grew as a person over time while the ninja helped. It's such a fun dynamic for the group, as on the surface, we're getting a reversal of the first season, having the ninja become Wu's mentors. But on a deeper level, it's a subtle mechanism for showing how, just like the ninja learned from Wu, he learned from them. That's a side of their master-student relationship we've never seen before. From the pilots all the way through season 7, it's been a non-stop back and forth of the ninja asking for wisdom and him giving it. So adding this element helps deepen their bond by showing that he needs them as much as they need him. I wasn't expecting Wu's story to go in that direction at all, but I'm glad this is where it went. And due to how it's written, his and Lloyd's stories sync up thematically, so their journeys are connected whether they're together or not, adding to the greatness of both. If I had to pick between one or the other based on quality though, I, unsurprisingly, gotta give it to Lloyd's story over Wu's, as Harumi and Garmadon remain the the greatest villains this series has ever seen, and nothing could top them. Iron Baron, the leader of the Dragon Hunters, is fairly compelling for what he is. It was nice having a villain whose minions weren't evil, just manipulated into following the fear he put in them, but I can't not say that Harumi and Garmadon are better. They're too immaculate of villains for me to say otherwise. And same as Lloyd, this season takes their relationship in a new direction entirely. One that genuinely would have made me sympathize for Harumi if she wasn't, well, Harumi. The girl that resurrected the purely negative half of a man, devoid of humanity, so she could get back at his son and use him to take over Ninjago, crafting him into the exact person he never wanted to be to satiate her ego. Basically, Bitch brought this on herself, so she needed some comeuppance. And ooh boy, does Ninjago deliver on that front. It knows precisely what Harumi deserves after what she's done, and lets us see every delicious moment of her downfall. She's got an arc this season that's the exact inverse of Lloyd, starting at the top and slowly but surely falling as she realizes her animosity is self-destructive, represented through her relationship with Garmadon. At first, Harumi's able to control it and use it to her advantage. She puts all of her trust into this feeling and allows it to run rampant, believing the power it brings can earn her authority. But eventually, that feeling becomes too powerful for her to control, so it begins to hurt her. It destroys the people she cares for, lashing out indiscriminately. It begins to show what happens when you allow hatred to overcome everything else. And she can't help but cling on to it, as she's put so much trust in this feeling to guide her actions, she can't bear the thought of it being wrong. That's where she gets the idea to become Garmadon's surrogate daughter at the halfway point. From a certain perspective, you could see it as purely another move from Harumi to get at Lloyd, going so far as to take the very affection of his father away from him. But when you look at it from where Harumi's standing, it's evident she's doing this as a last desperate ploy to hold on to her faith in him, and by extension, 
her spite. She had transformed Garmadon, her hero, her role model, her deity, into exactly what she herself wanted to be. Therefore, for all intents and purposes, he should have turned out flawlessly, but he doesn't. Through her guidance, he becomes an uncontrollable monster feeding on conflict, and Harumi, after enough abuse, sees that it reflects who she's become. There are no more curtains to put up, no more rose-tinted glasses to view her choices by. Garmadon forces Harumi to see her actions for what they truly are, and so in her final moments, she runs. Where to exactly, she doesn't know. But she has to get away from it all. It's impossible for her to face this reality knowing what she's become. That is, until she finds another reflection of herself. The scared, confused girl about to lose her parents to a force far beyond her control. Like with Garmadon, it'd be easy to run away from the problem and save herself, but knowing what that loss could do to someone and how it's left her, she decides to become the hero she needed back then, helping to end the cycle of hatred in a final act of clarity and repentance. Thankfully, this isn't a redemptive act for everything she's done. The show doesn't try to pretend this makes up for all her blatant terrorism, but if anything, it was a send-off that gave her character closure, which is all it needed to be to help Season 9 end on a super comfortable note. Don't know how they're gonna round this storyline off, but if this is anything to go by, it'll be great. Ah, uh, fucking damn it, Ninjago. You had me for two seasons. 20 full episodes. That's longer than you've ever gotten me to praise you in an uninterrupted span of time without any complaints to follow. And I was hoping you'd keep the momentum up for the finale to this Oni saga. Is that so unreasonable, that after two amazing seasons you'd pull out all the stops to make this a super engaging, charming conclusion? I came in expecting big things for once, you got me to hope, but then I watched it, and it wasn't good, it isn't good, it's mid, it's mid, and I know it didn't have to be. There are small pieces, or rather there's one small bit, that resemble the last two seasons and made this more bearable. Garmadon. His character goes in a fascinating direction this season, wondering if he can be more than what Harumi taught him to be. And you know what? It's intriguing. I liked it and wanted to see more of Garmadon's journey with the cameraman from the local news station. But then I didn't. In fact, a majority of stories this season were either too short for the complexity they could have had, or got cut off right as they were about to get interesting. And I already know why that is. This season, quote unquote, is only four episodes long, so none of the ideas got time to be fleshed out. Why is it four episodes long? That's not enough time for this story to finish. It's hardly big enough to fit in all the fan service to past seasons, since, oh right, this was also going to be the finale to the whole series. So there was a big push to build it around honoring the past, no matter how badly it impacted the story. And in all fairness, I get the sentiment. When you have a series that's gone on for as long as Ninjago, it's sensible that after so long, you'd want to celebrate its history through a legacy season, bringing in references and callbacks for fans who've stuck around. It's an admirable gesture that shows love for the franchise when done right, but reminder here, four episodes long. There's no time to integrate these tributes into the story, so almost all of them come off incredibly superficial and cheap. The intro is a collage of important events over the series. We get a mural to celebrate the ninja's adventures. There's a scene of Lloyd running through a base full of artifacts they've used or picked up over the series. They bring the gold weapons back to fight the Oni. A tornado of creation saves everyone for a dumb bullshit reason and ends the fight. But none of it feels natural or earned. As I was watching, I distinctly got a feeling that the writers were putting this in with the logic of, oh shit, I forgot, this is the final season and we don't have anything planned to acknowledge that. Quick, throw in whatever you can so we can include them. Make the ending a callback, I don't care if it's a deus ex machina with no emotional weight, just do it. It all leads to such an unfulfilling finish. Not that the rest of it was any less disappointing. Like, I'm not someone that tends to bitch if a story takes an unexpected turn. I am an unapologetic fan of fairy tale. But we had two seasons of pure buildup telling us how scary and dominating and menacing the Oni are, and then 
what do they do? They pull smoke out of their asses that freezes people, they walk up the stairs to the monastery, and they're all killed simultaneously by the tornado due to blah blah creation something something destruction. That's all they do. It's not a satisfying finale for the season, let alone the story arc, let alone the series. There's not a single thing grand or final or thematically conclusive about the fights. Battling on a skyscraper and overcoming personal identity issues whilst another group fights a giant stone mech as a war rages on is epic. A couple dozen copy-pasted models walking up to a gate and getting spun around until they die is not. It has the same vibe as Day of the Departed, a self-contained mini-story that, if not for one or two permanent changes, could have been written off as non-canon with nothing lost. It doesn't come off anywhere close to feeling like the biggest problem the ninja have ever faced. This should be a Tuesday for them. It sure as hell isn't a situation where they could all feasibly die. That's never gonna be believable in this scenario, and you can't trick me with individual characters either. Oh no, Cole fell into the darkness. I guess he forgot air jitsu. You know, the spin jitsu that lets you fucking fly. What a tragic, spontaneous moment of memory loss. Now he's gone forever and ever. I'm feeling such emotions right now. Better cue that sad orchestral music as he dramatically falls in slow motion. What an unavoidably tragic death. No wait, he's cool. Uh, yeah, but, but oh no, again! After our tornado of creation, Lloyd is miraculously dead for no given reason. What a world! Wait, nah, never mind. He was just getting compliments from the first Spinjitsu master in heaven, seeing as undoubtedly this was their biggest achievement yet, deserving a praise from God himself. I gotta tell ya, out of all the cliches Ninjago's used, fake out anime deaths wasn't on the checklist, but it's amazing that they managed to do it more than once in the span of two episodes. I think Dareff's on unlocked his true potential in the mastery of crap writing. <sighs> Dude, this season had everything going for its success. Two intentionally well-connected, planned out, evocative seasons to hype it up, endless foreshadowing of the danger about to come, the chance to pay homage to the franchise and a loving send-off for what might have been its final moments. Then it got four episodes and came falling down on top of itself like a sandcastle at high tide. Hopefully with this semi-reboot coming, they'll try to take lessons from 8 and 9 and stay far away from all of this. Nope, alright, we're officially back on the bullshit. I'm sorry I ever thought that I could hope. And just for an additional slap to the face, they couldn't even give us the same brand of bullshit. There's a whole new world of problems this season as a result of the format, which has gone from 22 minutes per episode down to 11. Now, at first, I didn't think this would be too much of an issue, as to make up for it, the number of episodes has more than doubled, so it sounded like a fair trade-off. But, as is usually the case, I was being dumb. No Doria show's gonna have to switch it up if the time to tell serialized stories in a bigger narrative is halved. That's gonna lead to a major shift in priorities, and it's where the first noticeable issues this season come from. A clunky transition into this new tighter format. I mean, think about the difference here. During the original series, they could hold one or two big concurrent plots per episode without needing to cram. They had plenty of breathing room to experiment and fill the extra time in an otherwise completed story, but now, the space to tell those stories has been cut in half, so there is no extra time. They needed to limit the scope of each and every episode to keep them from having too much content for 11 minutes, so there were a few options. They could shrink the same format down and cut out all the fluff, switch between stories each episode and keep the regular vibe, do one big story with more depth. All good choices that could have worked with enough effort and willingness to work around the restriction. So, what did the staff for this season choose? Uh, none of them. They, uh, they did not pick any of the good options. Those would have been hard, so they went for the easiest route that required the least thought, removing all the parts that might be complicated to make it as efficient as possible. That means there is one continuous story that isn't deep, and worst of all, separates what used to be decently serious episodes with occasional levity into vignettes that are either all comedy or all plot. They've removed the in-between so one can't hinder the runtime of the other, keeping them in isolated lanes for the sake of simplicity. And 
and there's a major flaw to this. It leads to all the comedy episodes having no relevance, meaning they're effectively filler. Granted, the same could vaguely be said for the bits of comedy before this switch, but those had the distinction of 1. being relief for serious situations, 2. not getting in the way of the ongoing plot, and 3. being entertaining. Like, I've never been a massive fan of Ninjago's patented brand of humor, but it could be occasionally funny. There were moments that made me laugh, and they didn't take away from the episode, so I didn't mind. But now, with them fully divorced from the plot episodes, they've gone from fun interjections to easily skippable time wasters. For crying out loud, there's a full episode dedicated to B-list villains discussing who's the worst ninja in these surreal 2D segments. And they're not terrible per se, I've seen way worse stabs at comedy from action shows, believe me, but whether you like these episodes or not, you can't deny they bring any story progression to a grinding halt, and it gets super annoying by the time we reach the second arc of the season where things actually start happening. Because oh yeah, for I'm guessing marketing reasons? The new staff decided to split this season into two smaller conflicts connected via the theme of fire and ice, and there's a huge gap in quality between the two. The first half of this? Absolutely unbearable. The best way that I could describe it is if you took the most memorable elements of season one, misunderstood why they worked, and sprinkled in a bunch of new boring elements for good measure. Just look at the introduction. The ninja are lazy from not having face to threaten a while, so they look for a quest, and that leads to a new, never before seen variant of the Serpentine arising from their tombs. Sounds exactly like the start of season one, doesn't it? Well, don't worry. They switch it up this time by making it so, instead of Lloyd purposely releasing the Serpentine, ignorant of the greater consequences, it's the ninja, who do it purely by accident after looking for trouble and searching a booby trap pyramid unprompted. Man, what a great way to show how this reboot will shake up the formula, right? Turning a moment that demonstrates early foreshadowing of Lloyd's own naivety and innocence into a series of comedic follies caused by the ninja being dumbed down to IQ's lower than a 10 year old. I fucking love it. It's truly like these last 10 seasons never happened. Oh, and just in case you thought things were getting a little too inventive here, we later discovered that the Serpentine released previously tricked Wu as a kid by taking advantage of his trusting nature. That's right, ladies and gentlemen, as I predicted, Glup Shido herself has appeared to seek vengeance on Wu after he was certain he'd never hear from her again. What does that make this? The fourth time Wu's been forced to confront an enemy from his past that he figured was gone forever, and the fourth time the Serpentine had been heavily involved in a season plot, and the second time we've seen this sort of relationship after Lloyd and Pythor, and the second time a character had a weapon that could steal elemental powers? Gee, you're really breaking new ground here, guys. I've never seen this many reused cliches in a single character before. It would almost be impressive if it wasn't so sad, seeing as you made a gender-bent Pythor, but the only things you couldn't copy were his insane sanity, or charisma. How do you fail that bad? It, it's sort of awe-inspiring. That you could take all these character traits and instill them into one that's supposed to be, I suppose, an improved version of an older iconic villain, yet she's missing anything that made him interesting to begin with. She just shows up, Rex shit, tries to get back at Wu cause she's a conceited bitch that deluded herself into thinking he betrayed her, and she gets beaten in 5 seconds flat, same as the Oni. Not sure what's up with these last few villains and their proclivity for being defeated so effortlessly, but hey, for such an underwhelming villain and story, it is pretty on brand as a total waste of everyone's time. Really, you could cut this half of the season up into the first two episodes, the one where they release her, and the mid-season finale, and you wouldn't miss much of anything since you've seen most of it before but better. It's called Rise of the Serpentine. You should check it out. It's like this, but the characters aren't idiots, it's not totally unoriginal, and the antagonist isn't just useful for kicking off the second arc of the season. An arc that, speaking of, is super forgettable on its own, but coming right after fire, it's a godsend. Following the trend of taking from other season premises, Ice has a similar setup to 4, even more so than 5. Zane has gone missing, this time because Serpentine Bitch Aspira zapped him to a snowy realm with shape-shifting Brother Bear Inuits, don't ask, so the ninja need to find him while simultaneously taking down the mysterious, and definitely not related to their search, Ice Emperor. 
dang, I wonder who this ominous figure with ice powers in a world we've never seen before is. There are so many options. It could be Zane with amnesia again, perhaps Zane with amnesia once again, or my personal favorite, Zane with amnesia again. Damn. Would you look at that? It was Zane with amnesia again. What a surprising twist. The person we thought was one thing ended up being another thing, and the writers did such a clever job hiding it behind totally not incompetent ploys to throw us off the trail. So shocking. All right, sarcasm aside, this is a slightly better twist than Skylar in that it isn't too immediately obvious, and he's controlled by his subordinate as opposed to a superior, so that's something, but... To be frank, I'm barely gonna remember it or anything that happened in ICE by the time this video is uploaded, and that goes double for fire. Both arcs are just incredibly skippable, and everything they add to the lore is garbage, so if you choose not to watch them, you're not gonna be missing out on much. All it has to offer are Aspira, who's annoying, the Ice Realm, which is dull, Forbidden Spinjitsu, a dumb concept that's dumb and not worth discussing, and some hilariously shitty character writing that, to its credit, is the one thing that made this season mildly entertaining. Or I guess I should say multiple things, since as another side effect of the change in presentation, story along struggles revolving around one character have been replaced for various small subplots that all equally suck in equally annoying ways. First up, Kai loses his powers to Asphira, so we get a mini story about him feeling useless on the team as a result. And you'll never guess how they resolve it. I bet it's another engaging look at what a character is beneath their powers, giving Lloyd and Kai something to bond over and form that relationship the series wanted them to have in Season 5. Or maybe after Asphira's been captured and his powers are still gone, Kai has to take up another role on the team, bonding with Nia, who used to be in the same spot. Or, oh, oh I got it, to maintain the status quo, he could just get them back by believing in himself, mirroring the equally idiotic wish rules from season 6 that state his power is never truly gone. It's not like there were multiple seasons before this that explicitly dealt with the idea of powers being stolen or imbued in artifacts. That would make this all super inconsistent, and they wouldn't do that, especially after they confirmed that the previous seasons are all canon through the prison containing old foes. Hey gang, no particular reason, but let's divert our attention from that totally not continuity breaking arc to look at Wu and his struggle. He's got to confront his past and the guilt that comes with it for the gajillion of time. Isn't that exciting? Or how about Nia? She learns to control ice. I'm sorry, what the fuck? Okay, look, I get that fundamentally ice and water are various states of the same material, but there are two elemental powers here. What's the point of giving them a distinction if one can control another? Is this applicable to Zane too? Can he control water? Can Kai control smoke? Can Cole control metal? Why are the writers not capitalizing on the potential here? This could inspire a season unto itself. I take it over this lame, monotonous shit, that's for sure. God, this was so mediocre. If I could give one compliment, the action has improved, integrating a mix of smears and 2D action lines to help with fluidity. It's nice to know they're experimenting with the visuals so late into the game to keep it from getting stale. So I can commend the new team for that, but it's not nearly enough to make watching the season itself worth it, so eh. Wow. I didn't think this series could get any less creative, but here we are. Color me impressed. Er, not impressed. Here I was, assuming we'd reached a plateau of blandness that couldn't go any flatter, but then season 12 comes around with the we're in a video game premise, and I just, I, I had to drop to my knees in pure astonishment. They seriously went there. I can't believe the crew would go out of their way like this to rip off the classic sci-fi film Spy Kids 3D. What? You think that's a joke? As far as I can tell, it might have been an unintentional tribute, but there are strangely a large number of moments in this season that are super close to SK3. Unknowing kids get sucked into a parallel video game world, one of the main cast members gets a cult following in said game, the cast are trying to reach a level that no one's ever gotten to before, there's a race, a 1v1 tournament battle, the villain is someone that's been trapped in the digital world for several years who uses the players to make it to reality, resulting in a giant mech fight that ends with a 
personal conversation. The one thing it doesn't have is Robert Rodriguez's eccentric charm or imagination. This season has no imagination. If you've seen a video game parody, you've seen Lego Ninjago Prime Empire. Just look at all the cliches I didn't list off. A side-scrolling section, NPCs questioning their autonomy after realizing they're in a game, self-learning AI becoming a threat, a villain that uses cheats to win. You can say I'm nitpicking if you want, but this season has virtually, pun intended, no character development for our main group, so it's ride or die on being uniquely entertaining. And when it comes to this, there ain't nothing unique about it. Unless you want to count how it isn't unique compared to Season 11, since it copies loads of external isekai and sci-fi media as opposed to earlier seasons of Ninjago. Though actually, then again, it doesn't really have that going for it either, as thematically speaking, this whole premise is a perfect match for Season 6's genie rules. A bland execution of expansive tropes that lead to a litany of unaddressed plot holes. The only difference here is that the ninja aren't the ones causing the plot holes, it's the villain, Unagami, who strangely reminds me of another property I talked about years ago, <laughs> Space Jam 2. And I, I know that sounds like an out of nowhere comparison, but stay with me here. In Space Jam 2, A New Legacy, the Don Cheadle villain's plan was that he'd get tons of people in cyberspace for a basketball game, and then when he won by cheating, he'd keep them there forever. Thus, I brought up in my review of the film that it would have made way more sense if after he got the people, he cancelled the game portion or made it impossible for the heroes to win, as he'd essentially already gotten what he needed and had full control. So giving the team a winning chance had no benefit to him or his plan. And it's the same in Prime Empire. Unagami is a self-learning AI that wants to get answers from his creator who abandoned him by using players as energy to generate a portal to the real world. Now, I could ask more about the specifications on what makes human energy special and how it powers a portal into the real world, as it's never explained, but ignoring that, the real question I want to ask is, why does Unagami let the players play. It's not as if he's above cheating, there are points in the story where he'll ask NPCs to sabotage the players, and he can manipulate the space of the game to spawn in red visors to fight the ninja, so... Why not spawn in a million red visors? How about you open up a hole in the floor that the ninja and any subsequent players immediately fall into? Why are you giving the players an opportunity to reach you? The basic structure of the story is that the ninja go into the game and play to get keys to unlock Unagami's level, having four lives as Unagami cheats to get them killed faster. But why are they allowed to do that? Just collect their energy after they step into the light of the cabinet. You control everything. That's what separates him and Don Cheadle in Space Jam 2. Don Cheadle isn't the game itself. He's a hacking algorithm thing. He uses LeBron James' kid's game to build his own, and in the end, that means the kid, who knows all its flaws, can use his knowledge to win. And that's how the trope of the cheating character usually goes. They're an outside force that's managed to manipulate a poor portion of the game in their favor, but to an extent, they still have to follow the rules of said game. Unagami doesn't have that distinction. He is the game itself, and he's got no incentive to let the players have a chance at stopping him. All he wants to do is find and confront his creator to ask why he was left abandoned, and he'll do whatever it takes to reach that goal. So, in my eyes, there shouldn't be any complications about this. It might have been more understandable if he had any other motivations, traits, or personal hangups to stop him from ending the game immediately, but he doesn't, so his behavior makes no sense. And the last second twist regarding his true identity doesn't help the situation either. If anything, it just makes his portrayal before the twist even more confusing. You see, across the majority of the season, Unagami is intentionally played up as a sinister, unfair, godly figure, so that in the end, we can have the tables turned by revealing he's not evil at all. He's more like a kid, confused at the world and looking for his deadbeat dad, harboring no malicious intent. And what I hate about this is that neither of these assertions are ever foreshadowed or implied by the character's actions. On the idea of having a young mindset, he doesn't act like it, and if he was intended to, it never comes across due to the fact that he barely does or is shown doing anything until the end of the season. I almost forgot that he was supposed to be omnipresent and all-powerful. Two things you'd think a kid would 
would have tons of fun messing around with. If he's supposed to be an immature, misguided child with a shit ton of power, let him flaunt it more. That would have been a good justification for letting people play. He wants to mess with them. It could have led to so much comedic potential of this ancient, ominous being that doesn't act intimidating whatsoever. And it could have extended to the game world too for a bit of visual storytelling. Wouldn't it be cool if Prime Empire were a logical mess as a result of Unagami's meddling, producing a disjointed experience that hardly anyone who doesn't think like him could adapt to? That would help characterize his childlike qualities and give him the innocent angle they failed to demonstrate in the show. Like, they can say he was innocent and pure all they want. It doesn't change that he knew what he was doing by collecting people's raw energy in the game after they died. He understood the ramifications of using so many people to generate his exit, and he didn't care one way or another. That's all they would have needed to change to make him sympathetic, too. Just have him be unaware of the long-term harm his actions could have as the citizen of a world where people can die and come back to life. It would have given him a naive side as a kid looking to find and talk to his dad, not realizing the pain he was causing other families by doing so. But that's not how he is, so no matter how young he looks, I'm not gonna believe that he's blameless in all this, the little bastard, he's technically over 30 years old. I'm not gonna be tricked by anime logic. No matter how much this season resembles a filler arc for how inconsequential, bare bones, unfulfilling, and lame it is. Get this shit out of my face. Damn, I just noticed. How has it taken us this long to reach a Cole-centric storyline? We've had 12 seasons so far, a majority of which are themed around one character and their issues. With that in mind, you'd assume Cole would have had his own by, what, season 6 at the latest? But nah. In actuality, there's such a massive disparity between who gets the most attention, it's kind of absurd. At the top, as you'd expect, there's Lloyd, with four, technically five seasons about him. That's Legacy of the Green Ninja, the Oni Trilogy, and Possession if you want to get technical. Then below him, there's Kai with Tournament of Elements and Hands of Time, Zane with Rebooted and Secrets of Forbidden Spinjitsu, Jay with Skybound and Prime Empire, and Nia with Possession and Hands of Time. We've all got two! That's right, out of all the ninja, Cole isn't just the last one to get a season, he's only been granted this privilege after everyone, including Nia, who joined the team five seasons in, got their turn twice. Unless you want to count Day that a part of that is, but come on, no one gives a shit about Day of the Departed, it was barely his story. All anyone thinks about when you bring that up is the bunch of villains that came back for fan service. Cole was totally overshadowed, and yet it was all he ever had for the longest time. That and a bunch of side plots that never went anywhere, like being turned into a ghost and the oh-so-shitty love triangle where he was definitely gonna lose. My man's been disrespected by everyone, and it hurts to see, as he's always been the most likable ninja that came from the most modest setting. He wasn't an orphan blacksmith or a robot or a junkyard mechanic born to a movie star. His mom just so happened to be the previous master of Earth, and as many people do, she died. Not from time-traveling kidnappers or skeletal marauders, just regular sickness. And that led to Cole taking on a responsible role. He wanted to fill the space his mom left behind, believing his dad was ignoring the loss to keep from feeling sad about it, so he'd have to bear the weight for both of them. It's a simple but effective backstory that feels so earnestly human and perfectly explains what he's about without needing to say much at all. So giving him a story arc was exciting, as to me, he was the one that most clearly deserved it. So how do they fuck it up? Well, same as Day of the Departed, Masters of the Mountain squanders its potential by making Cole struggle a subplot to something else. First it was ghost villains seeking revenge, now it's a sorcerer causing generic fantasy race drama that we just had to see in greater detail for its many complexities. Tell me if you've ever heard this one before. A secretly evil wealthy elite builds a shining flawless utopia that, unbeknownst to the citizens, is funded through the slave labor of a lower class kept right below it. Uh, oh, every young adult dystopian novel ever written, you say? Correct! And if you want to get to the small portion of the season about coal, you're gonna have to swim through an ocean of it. What, what, you're saying you didn't want to see the writer's D&D campaign brought to life? But they've got so many silly joke characters for the players, I mean ninja, to interact with. They've even got an evil necromancer that... <gasps> 
is actually the totally good king we met in the first episode? What? How unexpected. I swear, later seasons have been so obsessed with twist villains ever since Harumi, but they've all come out so underwhelming and insignificant. Ice Emperor was lame and predictable, Unagami got redeemed too quickly, and this King Vangelis is serviceable, but he didn't do anything to make his betrayal sting. We knew him for like an episode, and then he turned on the ninja. We barely got a feel for him before he takes off the mask. It's basically a twist for twist's sake. And that's not nearly enough to stand out. What made Harumi such a great villain wasn't just the twist itself, it was the implication behind the twist. She put on a fake masquerade explicitly to hurt Lloyd, giving her actions a personal edge that helped the reveal stick in your mind. That's what Vangelis is missing. Anything to make the twist unexpected and shocking, considering the person we knew him to be before and after the twist. But we didn't know much about Vangelis before his betrayal, and after he becomes a villain, he stays as boring as ever, so it lacks any significant meaning, making him possibly the most disappointing twist villain so far. All there is to his personality is being greedy and underhanded, two things you can apply to almost any villain in the show, and he makes the fantasy races hate each other to keep them from revolting so getting them to make up is the main conflict for about half the season. If you want a summary of what that conflict boils down to, it's pretty much that one episode of Avatar where two tribes think one of their ancestors stole from the other, so they refuse to work together. It's just missing one thing, the brevity of being a single 22-minute episode in a better series. Since, and I cannot emphasize this enough, it really should have been a minor subplot instead of overtaking the main story. After all, the whole reason for including these copies paced gremlins in the first place is to explain how great Cole's mom was. That she was a hero who saved and inspired courage in them, which Cole wants to live up to but has difficulty doing. That's the small bit of Cole material I was talking about earlier, and it has an intriguing premise about a member of his family we've never known before, so you'd think the season would overall be about establishing the relationship between Cole and his mother to help us understand their bond, but weirdly, as I mentioned, it is severely outweighed by the story meant to explain part of her legacy. And to be fair to the Gremlin race story, it's not terrible in isolation. The ninja side stories with them are kind of cute, and it does help Cole see that his mom was powerful from being herself, so he should do the same and forget about chasing her standard. It has a purpose in Cole's character arc if you take out all the filler, and it's decently entertaining, so I'm not saying it's worthless. What I am saying is that it detracts from any proper relationship building we could have had between Cole Cole and his mom, leaving the emotional core of his ambition sort of hollow. Why does Cole want to live up to his mom's standard? Did she inspire certain elements of his moral code or personality, other than the incredibly basic promise of fight the unjust? Was she a guiding force in his life before she died? Did he know much about who she was as a person? These are all questions that need to be clarified before we can truly get Cole's motive and struggle, but they're left unanswered. We never understand almost anything about why he feels the need to live up to his mom's legacy, as their emotional connection to one another is endlessly vague. Honestly, I came in thinking the season was going to be about exploring that post-humorously, helping us figure out why she mattered so much to him and the impact her death left. But it's the exact opposite. I know close to zip about Cole's mom, other than that she was a hero and Cole looked up to her. How am I supposed to discern a person personality from that, let alone get a good vibe of the relationship she had with her son. The literal one instance of character we get for her is in a two minute flashback, and when Cole is channeling the inner essence of his mom's wisdom to take down Vangelis, he's thinking about this scene because there's nothing else to remember. I'm not gonna lie, it was really funny in an unintentional way. It's supposed to be this big moment of Cole becoming one with the person he most admired, but all I see is a demonstration of how poorly she was used over the story, acting more as a catalyst for Cole to have an arc rather than being a character unto herself. The fact it's presented as it is effectively does my job for me. I don't need to say anything. It's a self-criticizing paradox. And it could have been fixed like that if they moved a couple things around. Here's my suggestion. Lower the importance of the gremlin so there's more screen time for Cole's story, and then make his journey about discovering why and how he wants to live up to his mom. Have him question what it means to live up to someone, as he didn't know too much about his mom before she died, but he 
wants to fill her place, both as a ninja and at home, regardless. Possibly it's led to some identity issues, making him question whether he acts a certain way out of his own free choice, or if it's the side of him that's dead set on being like the image of his mom he has in his head. Those issues could then lead into a crisis after he discovers she was a hero beyond his wildest dreams, filling him with a mixture of pride and dread knowing there was a side of her that he never considered, making his inability to perform what she did all the more disheartening. Imagine the scene of Cole failing to perform his mom's secret move, but he doesn't get frustrated and quit after a couple tries. He keeps doing it over and over to the point it begins to hurt. His party tells him he can stop and take a break, but the words aren't getting through. He concentrates so intently on this move that he begins to silently cry, thinking he'll never reach the standard he wanted to live up to for his family and everyone that his mom helped during her life. He needs to be her replacement, since if he's not, what has he been reaching for? Why did he ever choose to become the master of Earth? These thoughts literally swirl around his head as he spins in vain to achieve what she did until he's tackled by Wu, who decides he needs to step in, same as he did in the actual series. But this time, it's not to give the obligatory ninja never quit line he repeats every other season. It's so he can tell Cole, as someone who knew both him and his mother, how alike they are. Their tenacity, their passion for saving others, their responsibility, but he isn't her. And with that, he starts listing off their discrepancies, the most prominent being that Cole is often so concerned with pleasing others, he never thinks of himself. Across this season alone, Wu's witness Cole put his mind and body through immense pain with disregard for his own safety to live up to his mom's ideal. And while admirable, it shouldn't be so important it trumps his own well-being. Wu then reassures Cole that although his mom is gone, her memory lives on through the people she's inspired including him. And it's more important to honor her by living for himself, just as she wanted him to, than dying for her. That is when he sees what his mom was truly about. Not through a short flashback containing a basic promise, not through a simple lesson about being yourself, but through the words of someone that, in ways, has become another parent to him. Helping Cole realize the importance of living for your own aspirations just as much as those of others. Boom delivers the same general message with a deeper emotional tie that reinterprets Cole's perceived lack of knowledge into a key plot point that keeps the gremlins in mind. <sighs> It really is a shame that this season wasted so much potential when it had all the pieces lined up for an exploration of Cole's character only for the writers to not see the forest for the trees. They put way too much emphasis on world building for this new setting, not giving enough time for Cole's story to get depth. What they gave us was above average and worked fine as an enjoyable distraction, but it ultimately detracted from the supposed lead, leaving behind yet another instance of his importance being eclipsed by the other ninja's adventures. This season isn't bad. It has cool concepts, enjoyable characters, a fine message, but the delivery was sloppy and the conclusion was unmemorable due to a scattered plot, misuse of time, a bland villain, and Cole's big moment lacking emotional payoff. For the time being, it's the top season in the 11 minute age, but that's not saying much. It's fine. What? It's 44 minutes of pure exposition for season 14, what do you expect? Would you look at that? A Nia season that doesn't waste its potential or underutilize her? Hallelujah! Finally, after five long seasons of continually mediocre or straight up awful content, we've reached another season that exceeded my expectations. I tell you guys, I was starting to worry that after season 11, it was going to be a constant crapshoot for the rest of the video. And for the most part it has been, but like an oasis in the desert, this water-based season came around to quench my thirst. And the funny thing is, beneath the Atlantean theming, season 14 actually has a lot in common with 11 through 13. The only deviation between them is that here, they're not done terribly so in retrospect it kind of makes me hate the others more but hey we're being positive let's keep it that way 
for now. Seriously though, Seabound is a perfect example of the writing crew learning from their mistakes and using what they knew to their advantage, including the inspired by other seasons bit. They even take heavy cues from the same sources, repurposing all the major villain elements from season 1 that weren't used for season 11. Specifically, the threat this time around is a Merconian who wants to awaken an ancient evil sea serpent that was previously hidden away by the first Pinjitsu Master, requiring a special MacGuffin to do so. Then, once the beast is unleashed, the character who so wanted to control it can't and gets eaten, meaning the cast have to make a tough decision to finish it off. It's all very in line with Pythor's story, so why does it work where the others didn't? because it purposefully takes the best elements from Season 1 and adds its own spin to them without destroying any of their core entertainment value. I mean, why wouldn't you want a Pythor-like character who's despicable in a fun way? If you're gonna wear your inspirations on your sleeve so openly, you might as well successfully copy part of what made it work, and that's what Season 14 does. Eleven thought about it too much in the literal sense of having serpentine and cool abilities, but those things are meaningless if they haven't got a delightfully wretched bastard behind them. And 14 delivers through the character of Kalmar, who I would describe as an unapologetic sea Hitler. He wants to kill all the surface dwellers for being inferior, he destroys his own cities and endangers civilians for short-sighted self-gain, he straight up mercs his own dad in front of the ninja to blame them for it. It goes on and on like this. He's absolutely irredeemable in the most ridiculous type of way, and thankfully, though he's clearly in inspired by Pythor, the two are almost nothing alike otherwise. When it came to motivation, Pythor was driven mad with vengeance after being wrongfully entombed in a cave for decades. Naturally, that would make him lose his mind, and it would give him nothing but time to think out his strategy. Meanwhile, Kalmar doesn't have any of that. He's a pampered prince that wants to crush everyone beneath him because he said so. And this could have been a downside depending on the execution, but it works by accentuating how much of a little shit he is. He's faced none of the hardships Pythor had to go through, having grown up in a supportive rich family that didn't like his cringe fish racism. So whenever he fails, it's twice as satisfying. There were no outside forces that caused him to be this way, just the self-inflicted desires of a whiny brat that hopes to shoot and break what he doesn't like. Believe it or not, I love this type of villain. There's nothing I enjoy more than a despicable, heartless son of a bitch with no redeeming qualities, and Kalmar hits all the right notes. He's a dude that revels in being evil, and he does it with a wonderfully hateable personality. That's all he needs for his defeat to be gratifying. And as for how he was stopped, I may have compared it to Season 1 as simply a tough decision, but there's a lot more to it than that. Mainly, the act itself, that being Nia's sacrifice of forever merging with the ocean to stop the sea serpent, hits way harder than the temporary compromise of giving Garmadon the golden weapons by being something permanent. The ninja could and were able to get the weapons away from Garmadon with enough time, but season 14 is upfront that Nia can't come back from this. It is a non-retractable decision, so it carries a much heavier weight, and the value of that sacrifice is compounded by it being a crowning representation of all she stands for, as well as a strong closer for an arc with her mom. In fact, this moment serves as a nice microcosm of all that season 14 does to fix previous issues with Nia's character, giving us the first instance of her making a super impactful decision for herself since season 6. Like, I brought it up a couple times before, but after season 1, most of Nia's agency in the series was lost entirely. First, she was passed around as the main object of a love triangle, then she had the status of water ninja forced onto her, then she got to choose to be Jay's girlfriend in Skybound, but from then on, we haven't seen anything significant regarding her worry about being independent. Her development hasn't been stagnant necessarily. Season 7 had her coming to terms with someone else holding the Samurai X title now that she doesn't need it, examining another part of Nia, her obsession, possibly signaling the end of her independent story but I never got the feeling it was done. To me, there was still room for the trade to be utilized, and Seabound proves that by dissecting its harmful qualities, going into the flaws that come along
along with the mindset that trying to do everything on your own isn't always the best option, that it's okay to ask for help and you won't be less self-sufficient if you do. It's a rare instance of us seeing the negative side of a generally celebrated value in American culture, showing how through Nia's stubbornness, she shuts people out when she needs them most, drawing a line that no one can cross, including her parents. It's why they haven't been seen since the end of season seven. And I can tell it was thought up as an excuse in hindsight, but it's such a good excuse I can't find it in me to get mad. Plus, it lets them return to their previous issues without a coming off force, so whatever, I'm not gonna complain. I was hoping the parents would come back to make up for their lackluster reunion from the moment season seven ended. And this has a smart explanation for that too. It acknowledges how Kai and Nia didn't know their parents that well before meeting them again in season seven and uses that to say they didn't know how to connect afterwards, so they simply lost touch when the fighting was done. That's a surprisingly mature answer I wasn't expecting, and it goes double for why Nia wants to avoid them. It doesn't come from a grudge against them, she doesn't have any personal resentment towards the parents for leaving to protect them from the horrors of a sword wielded by a man with a fake mustache. It's just a matter of not knowing how to feel about them suddenly reappearing in her life after 10 years of making it on her own with Kai, so at first, she keeps them distant out of a fear that they could get her to doubt herself. She's become so certain of her identity as of late that she doesn't want to complicate it, going back to her fear of facing things that could be difficult. Thus, it's interesting how, after slowly opening up to her mom and understanding each other's viewpoints, gaining a deeper respect for one another, Nia's sacrifice does more than demonstrate her freedom to choose. It confirms the bond she and her mother have formed, mutually accepting the difficult choice she has to make. I said it once and I'll say it again, it's the final move that encapsulates everything good about Nia's character. I'd put it around the same spot as Garmadon in terms of meaningful sacrifices, and it helps to round out one of the best seasons this era and the show itself has seen. Ah, oh, shit, that hurts. Oh, sorry. I was just reacting to the whiplash this season gave me. Like, I was right there, complimenting the series, calling it good, and then Crystallize came around to fuck everything, dude. It is the first season I've seen that actively regressed any worthwhile content it had all at once. I'm talking 8, 9, 14. You heard me. The season I was praising five seconds ago, it's the first thing this ruins. It got out of the gate, eyes red, fangs bared, and it pounced right on the closest piece of content in the vicinity. You want to guess what they do? I'll tell ya. It starts out wonderful, genuinely. The cast have spent a year processing their grief over Nia's death and decide to come back together for her sake, knowing she'd want them to keep moving forward. It's simple, touching, emotional, the first time this series has ever pulled off a season aftermath this well, and the next episode we cut to Nia as a water dragon protecting sailors. I already know where this is going, but it fills me with dread anyway. We learned that for whatever unexplained reason, after a year, the stated time it would take for Nia to forget her identity and fully fuse with the ocean, she somehow retains consciousness and remembers who she is after seeing messages, deciding she wants to return to her friends. However, you might remember me saying that this was stated to be a permanent change that could not be undone. And for all we knew, it was. In season 14, they literally say she cannot un fuse after the fusion takes place. So I figured this has to be a fruitless endeavor. They said there's no way to go back, so she's not gonna turn back. But it turns out she can come back if she gives up her powers. All right, that's it. Somebody's gotta get stabbed. Somebody's gotta get stabbed. Stop! And I don't know what's worse, that the writers might have had this twist planned out seasons in advance, as other elements of this story were, or that this was never the original plan and was made up on the fly. It's a narrative choice that shares so many elements with both, I can't tell for sure. On one hand, there were vague implications back in season 11 about Nia's greatest worry being if she were normal and never unlocked her true potential. Now, silly me, I thought this was talking about if she had no skills whatsoever, as seasons prior, at least up to were adamant that she had a range of talents and wasn't defined by her status as the water ninja, but... 
I guess they were wrong. She does directly tie her self-worth to being the water ninja, and she was saying she'd be normal if she didn't have powers. And that is so fucking strange coming from Nia, but also, at the same time, I see how we got here. Starting from around season 8 onward, she gradually began to lose importance in the narrative, slowly getting less individual uses until she became the exact role the show used to mock. The girl without any distinct features besides her gender and element, forgetting everything else. It clearly wasn't an intentional choice, more so an oversight caused by undervaluing the character and her many talents, but whether they intended to or not, with Seabound, the series did set a precedent. Nia's element is now a fundamental part of who she is, and on its own, that isn't a bad thing. Like I said, for the longest time, she was a multifaceted character that strove to be more than the stereotype she was labeled as. So having a season centered around one of those facets isn't a problem. What is a problem, though, is how the series meant for this to be interpreted if season 11 is anything to go by. That Nia believes her elemental powers make her special, and she has no use in the team without them. It completely misses everything her character's about by letting something she couldn't choose define her worth. That's why, despite getting an indication in season 11, it's hard for me to tell if this was planned. That, and her total lack of importance once she comes back. I mean, after they dedicated so much of the early season to saving her, breaking a sphere out so she can take Nia's element, turning them into criminals and whatnot, you'd expect her to have a big role to make up for the absolute fuck you her resurrection was, but she doesn't do shit for the rest of the season. All she does is give up on training, believing it to be pointless, and eventually, as a new calling, she decides to become Samurai X, a move that is so baffling on so many levels seeing as 1. Season 7 was about her relinquishing that mantle, not holding on to the past, but that's what this is doing. And two, Pixel is Samurai X now. She has been for the past seven seasons, and she continues to be in this one. There are just two Samurai Xs now, and that's never addressed. Why don't we get to hear Pixel's opinion, Nia? You robophobe? You robist? Who do you think you are taking another person's current identity for your own without asking or discussing it? Elvis? All right, jokes aside, this is probably the worst thing they could have done for her character. And the fact that she never talks about this with Pixel is a massive missed opportunity. It would have been cool to see how she feels knowing Nia wants to take back what she gave Pixel in the first place, but we never get that, as Nia goes from feeling useless to being Samurai X again in the same episode. So we barely have any time to process the change. Oh, what's that? You say they could have shown that during the massive battle at the end of the season? Well, that would be possible under most circumstances, but for Nia to have her screen time better used, she'd need to have screen time, and she doesn't. Once she starts using the new Samurai X mech, she doesn't do anything for the rest of the season. She doesn't fight any of the big bad guys, she doesn't take part in the ninja's big transformation, she gets jack and shit. But I'll tell you what she does do, in the final few episodes, she starts regaining her power. You know, the power she was said to have given up to become human again, disconnecting herself from it altogether. The one consequence for her going back on a decision that was first stated to be impossible to change? Right, that one. It's back because, uh, fuck you, that's why. Power's never lost, that's what season 11 said. Who needs consequences? Consequences don't matter. Nia's sacrifice and tearful goodbye? Turns out it was pointless, meant nothing, was reversible, and in the end, she suffered no negative side effects. Not a single bad thing. She lost nothing. After all, who needs to sacrifice things into sacrifice, am I right? What's a sacrifice when you can return to the status quo? When you can turn your characters into shells of their former selves for the sake of cheap references to older seasons? That's this whole season's philosophy, isn't it? From the promotional images, to the premise, to the extended episode counts, it's no secret this is trying to be a legacy event, Avengers Endgame style. The showrunners want to give a finale to end all finales that captures the hearts of fans using a giant bomb of 2011 kid nostalgia, so to do that, they add in as many callbacks as they can for added scope, and it does not work at all. It's hilariously bad, actually. You thought Nia coming back to life and becoming Samurai X again didn't work? Then take a look at the Sinister Six style villain an alliance they've got going on, the Crystal Council. In theory, it's a classic comic book motif. Scoop up a bunch of the hero's greatest enemies and have them come together for a special all-star battle. You might even remember way back when the old crew squandered this in Day of the Departed, where I said it could have worked as a miniseries or film. So this must be exactly what I wanted, right? 
Wrong! I wanted the ninja to fight a team up of their biggest, baddest villains, and Day of the Departed allowed that through a sort of narrative cheat, bringing characters back from death to fight together, since the writers knew that was the only way they could bring in all the most iconic foes. It was a special situation that needed some bullshit reasoning to work. That's part of why I believe it was such wasted potential. The concept had so much room for creative liberties. Meanwhile, Crystallize doesn't have anywhere near that amount of freedom. All they can take from is the living, currently available cast, so that means their options for the Alliance are pretty limited. Let's see, Garmadon's off on a spiritual journey, so he's not gonna join. The Serpentine, Dragon Hunters, and Unigami have made peace with the ninja, so they're off the table. Nautikon is trapped in a lamp god knows where, while the Time Brothers are stuck in a perpetual rift. The Ice Emperor with Zane and his advisor can't be reached. Of course, Samukai, the Great Devourer, the Stone Warriors, the Nindroid Army, Chen, Klaus, Moro, Iron Baron, the Oni, and Kalmar can't come back for obvious reasons, so... Essentially, picking the best villains for this team must have been like trying to find the best candy in a bowl full of black licorice and almond joys. Nobody wanted them, that's why they're all that's left at the end of the night, but you gotta pick something. You've already committed to taking the candy, so you scourge around for a bit, seeing what's left to take, and it turns out there was a hidden Kit Kat in Pythor, who genuinely deserves to be here, but aside from him, it's nothing to get excited over. For people who like knockoff Kit Kats with none of the flavor, we've got Asphira, everyone's favorites. There's also dark chocolate covered in white powder, Vangelis, a glow-up ring that'll stop working in two hours, the mechanic, and a toothbrush, Mr. F, who so clearly doesn't belong here, you almost feel pity for the next kid who's gonna have even less to pick from. I got a little carried away in that analogy there, but my point is, aside from Pythor, these guys are all B-listers at best. This is less of a Sinister Six, more a Johnny Stopping Evil Force 5, the Costco bargain bin variety. It's a team that contradicts the very concept it's supposed to be paying homage to, as almost none of these guys were iconic in their own rights. No memorable plots, behaviors, personalities. They could be mistaken for any other villain of the week, and that's not what you want. Half of the fun of these kinds of team-ups, besides the pure enjoyment of seeing a bunch of iconic villains at once, is that, as a team, we see how their particular views and habits react to each other. Who they get along with, who they can't stand, who best matches them in a partnership. The interactions between antagonists should be one of the utmost priorities for these events, but the Crystal Council lacks any diversity in their ranks, making fun banter difficult. For instance, what's the difference between Asphira and Vangelis? Uh, Vangelis pretended to be good, but he wasn't. No, uh, hold on, um... He was the former ruler of a kingdom and gained his status through dishonesty. Damn it, uh, no. Uh, Vangelis is greedy and manipulative. Shit, okay, those two are weirdly similar. What about Mr. F and Mechanic? One of them is... He's so... And the other, man, he's just like... Fuck, they don't really have personalities, do they? Wow, this team is pathetic. I mean, Pythor's obviously the exception here, but he doesn't have anyone to bounce off of. There's no chemistry between these characters to speak of, so to keep people from noticing, the writers just split them up all season. At one point, they're in separate vehicles chasing down the ninja, in another, they're leading small crystal armies into Ninjago, but not once after their introduction do they have any meaningful conversation. They split up, cause minor inconveniences, and the ninja stop them. They They've been reduced to mini-boss status, having almost no major relevance to the plot, serving more as fodder than real threats. They don't even attack or carry out their objectives in a way that would harken back to their respective seasons. Them being there, in and of itself, is supposed to be the callback. It doesn't matter what they do, it only matters that the audience knows who they are and sees them on screen. They show up, take orders, and lose quickly so we can get back to the true main villain this season, the Crystal King, aka the Overlord. <sighs> Alright, so compared to Nia, I wasn't quite as mad about this revival. He's had bullshit returns before, so it's not exactly shocking, and he's described as a being that'll always exist to balance evil and good, so he'll never go away. But come on! Out of all the characters to lead a final attack against the ninja, you choose a guy that has no charisma, has already been the antagonist of two stories, came back once before, and hasn't been relevant for over a dozen seasons? I get he's the embodiment of evil and all, so technically speaking, there's no higher you could go in terms of power or villainy, but Pythor would have been a million times better. Not counting the specials, he was the first major baddie the series ever had. He left an impression that made him one of the 
the few characters I didn't mind returning every couple of years. He literally foreshadowed a great revenge he was planning in Day of the Departed. All the pieces are there for him to be the final boss, bringing the series full circle for a fan favorite character. And it all equates to nothing. How could you do this to my guy? I know that back in my season one review, I wasn't hyping him up too much, but now he's the best choice purely for how enjoyable he is, especially compared to this sorry display. But fuck it, fine. The Overlord is the ninja's last obstacle. What genius plan does he have to rule Ninjago and destroy them for good this time? Uh oh, a crystal army encroaching on Ninjago City, you say? Why, that's brilliant. They'll never see that one coming. Ninjago City was only attacked and or taken over in, uh, what, both of the Overlord's previous seasons, plus one, six, eight, nine, 10, 12, and 14? And the unstoppable army premise? Haven't seen that one since season 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, and 13. And would you look at that? They've also got characters being corrupted by the Overlord, who uses them as slaves to do his bidding. That doesn't sound similar to any other Overlord seasons. I'm gonna throw myself off a brick. The one thing I can't say was directly ripped from another Overlord story this season is the crystal theme itself. For sure, it's mostly an aesthetic thing, and the abilities it has are sort of a mix between the Oni and Overlord in Season 2, but at the bare minimum, it's not an aesthetic we've seen before, and there's a real fascinating story behind how he got it. Or I assume there is. Somewhere in the universe. The truth is, I don't know, it's a frustrating mystery that no one so much as questions the origin of. I guess it wouldn't be a true Overlord season without stupid ideas we're not supposed to think about, huh? Though speaking of, there's one specific stupid idea this season that shines above the rest as possibly the worst thing the Ninjago staff has ever done. That's right. Worse than bringing back Nia, forming the Crystal Council, or making the Overlord the final boss. This season found a precise way to top all those horrible decisions using a certain member of the Crystal Council I neglected to name before. A secret character I didn't specify among those who couldn't come back just in case some observant viewers wanted foreshadowing. You know him. You hate him. Everybody, give a big fat fucking welcome to Harumi. I can't find the words to describe how terrible this is. It is the most incompetent writing decision that possibly could have been made by the writers. There's no worse thing they could have written. I refuse to believe otherwise. It takes a character whose death could be described as no less than perfect. Perfect and brings her back as an antagonist. We're talking about a character who originally was consumed by her own self-destructive hatred to the point it literally killed her. A character who, in recognizing that she'd become exactly what she hated, chose to atone by saving others from sharing the same fate, regretting her choices as the consequences of those actions crushed her. It was tragic, emotional, and it flawlessly described what unadultered, irrational hatred ultimately leads to. Her death and regret were fundamentally intertwined with the arc her character experienced over seasons 8 and 9. But through the power of fuck you fan service, she's not only back, she's evil and chooses to work for the Overlord. As she definitely would. Who cares if she used to have a proper motivation for doing what she did? Why should it be a factor that she's got no personal connection to the Overlord and would therefore have no motivation to follow him? By the power of his brainless Kingdom Hearts speeches, the Overlord Overlord can just say, light, good, evil, darkness, darkness, and she's ready to fight again. That's what she would do. This doesn't go against everything she was about at all. She was evil in seasons 8 and 9, so that means she'll be evil in season 15. That's how characters work, right? Actions have no meaning. Symbolism? Fucking, uh, character progression? What's that? You sound fucking stupid. <laughs> I'm trying to keep it all together, guys. I'm, I'm doing my best, but this... Oh my god, this is so bad, and somehow, this isn't the worst part. You want to guess why? They redeem her. Harumi. They fucking redeem her! Why? 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 She dug her own grave. She chose to do everything that she did, and now she's been reduced to a cut-and-dry villain without any of the sympathetic traits she once had. How do you redeem that? Well, really, they don't. Or rather, by the end of the season, she's treated as though she were redeemed, but, uh, here's the thing. She doesn't do anything to redeem herself. All that happens is, from her reintroduction up to the second 
second to last episode of the season, she's totally complacent in whatever the Overlord does. In fact, she plays into it. He's not forcing her to do any of this. She has decided of her own volition to completely contradict any of the growth she got by the end of season nine. But in the second to last episode, she learns that the Overlord was the one who turned the Great Devourer evil, leading to her family dying and going down the road of evil, etc, etc, so she switches sides to help the ninja. That is her redemptive moment. That's why later on, Lloyd feels comfortable saying, It's okay guys, she's with us, and allows her to help rebuild the monastery with the rest of the ninja's allies, acting like all their shit was solved. She didn't take any of her actions back, she never says what she did was wrong, she doesn't face any punishment for her behavior, whatsoever. All because she had a Joker learns Red Skull's a real Nazi moment and, in a twisted bit of logic, goes against the Overlord for not being evil in the way she thought he was. Like, whoa! You're telling me I wasn't working for Hitler? I was working for Super Hitler? This changes everything! No, it doesn't! Stop smiling and go to jail, you sick bitch! I guess we can add her to the pile of characters brought back for fan service that had any character development revoked for a happy ending. But don't worry, if you think that pile's too small right now, we've got a bunch of protagonists left to go. I know I've already mentioned the absolute character assassination that is the return of Nia multiple times now, but it doesn't stop at her, not by a long shot. Look at Zane. His conflict this season revolved around going through a phase of turning off his emotions after Nia's death, stating that his feelings were getting in the way of productivity. And you might be thinking to yourself, well that doesn't sound too bad, obviously it's his way of dealing with the loss, and in the beginning, I I thought that too. I considered it a genius method for showing how he chose to cope with grief through his being a robot, which hadn't been utilized as a major plot point in a good number of seasons, and naturally I inferred that after Nia came back he'd turn his emotions back on. But he doesn't. He keeps them turned off, and later we learn that he actually did do it for proficiency, and it stays off until he learns that negative emotions are necessary through a dumbass side story that doesn't matter. Guys, we're 15 seasons in. Having Zayn learn emotions are needed this deep into the series would mean he didn't understand their importance until now. A line of reasoning that's kind of ridiculous, considering seasons 1 and 3 explicitly deal with how he can have humanity as a non-human. And negative emotions come with humanity, so... Doesn't that contradict everything Zane is? Lacking some basic understanding of human thought and needing the guidance of a random girl to learn otherwise? The answer is yes, and it's a disgrace, but still. He isn't the worst this season, since, to some extent, you could rationalize that as a result of having his emotions turned off for so long, he couldn't remember their use and needed to be reminded. That's clearly not how it is in the show at all, but you could think that. You could try. Master Wu, though, has no excuse. During this season, he acts in total opposition to everything he stood for over the course of the entire series, and I mean everything. It's honestly astonishing how low he falls, and it's not a gradual one either. Right out the gate, for the first half of the story, he acts like a massive pussy by outright refusing to break out Asphira so she can suck out Nia's element and bring her back. Seriously, he would rather allow his student to stay gone forever over breaking out a B-lister to help bring her back. It's such a cold, bitchy stance for Wu to have, and the only explanation he ever gives for why is that she She's a trickster that'll try to deceive them, which... Woo, aren't you the guy that chose to work with Garmadon back in Season 1 for the greater good? How is this any different? Also, she tricked you back when you were like 7, Woo. She's not a master manipulator. It shouldn't be a big moral dilemma between breaking her out of prison and letting Nia stay fused with the ocean forever. This is cowardly behavior if I've ever seen it, and no matter how the show might attempt to justify it, they're not gonna make Woo look any better. He even says the ninja deserved jail time for breaking the law regardless of what they did. The ninja have no one to blame but themselves. They broke the law and freed Asphira. Are you trying to make me hate him, or do you want me to see him as pathetic? Cause in all honesty, he did look like a massive wimp in the latter half when he contemplated giving up and had to be convinced by fucking children not to. 
Wu, the character whose one piece of arbitrary wisdom every season is Ninja Never Quits. He forgot that at the most crucial moment he possibly could and had to be reminded of it by toddlers. Who is this guy? What did he do with Wu? Somebody file a missing persons report. But I suppose having a character portrayed badly is better than being forgotten. Isn't that right, J. Cole and Kai? Sad that for a finale season you guys were totally sidelined and didn't do all almost anything significant, but hey, what are you gonna do? We needed more time for another story about Lloyd being super apologetic to Harumi and oddly hostile at Garmadon, regressing his character back to pre-season 9 for more petty melodrama. Sorry, do I sound tired? I just... It gets old repeating the same flaws over and over again, but season 15 keeps on doing them. It's like a never-ending train of fuck you after fuck you to this franchise, only briefly broken up by continuing Garmadon's character arc, which is pretty funny and nice. But no matter how much Garmadon content, it's never gonna be enough to fix this... Thing. Like, I wasn't expecting myself to defend this series in general, let alone from itself, but whether it's Nia or Harumi or the Overlord or his plan or the villain council or Wu or Zayn or Lloyd, all of it comes off as being done not out of love but spite and laziness. Taking the positive qualities this show accumulated and slowly ripping them into pieces one by one until nothing can be found. All for the sake of worthless callback after worthless callback. To to think that this is the end of Ninjago, at least as I've come to know it, is a fate I wouldn't wish on my worst enemy, but you know how it is. Ninjago is one of those franchises that's never truly gonna die, so all I can hope for is that with this next series on Netflix, when the time comes, they'll eventually learn how to stick a landing. I can't believe that after all these years, I've finally done it. I overcame a project I've been thinking of doing for so long but never thought would happen. It's... Such an odd feeling now that it's over. It was always this concept that stuck around in the back of my head, but for the longest time, I assumed I'd never finish it for how big of a project it would inevitably be. And dear god, it has been. This script alone has taken almost two months of non-stop writing and revising day in and day out, editing it to make sure I don't repeat certain phrases or words too often, getting it just how I like it so that in the end, I'll be satisfied. That's how much I cared about this video being good. It's been a journey for sure, one that was much longer than I ever could have imagined. I went into this thinking it'd be an hour and a half tops, but as you can see, it went a little longer than intended. Now on to my next big project, it's gonna be 15 hours long, fuck yeah. But for real though, this was an interesting experience, and to say the least, Ninjago does have far more to it than I initially thought. It's true that a lot of it is dumb, contradictory, mediocre, or outright shit, but I can't deny it has some genuine good, as much as the series itself tries to ruin it. If you want my personal plan for watching the series, I think the best way to go is Season 1 for genuine quality, Season 2 for ironic quality, Season 4 for Chin and Garmadon's arc alone, Season 5 for lore and a fun throwback to the original dynamic, Season 8 and 9 for everything, just know that Wu is a baby now, and Season 14 for Nia getting a season that truly defines her. Seasons 3, 10, and 13 are optional if you want them, I wouldn't recommend them personally, but for a more succinct opinion, here's my ranking. At the very, very, very bottom, it's crystallized, followed by Hands of Time, Prime Empire, Secrets of Forbidden Spinjitzu, Legacy of the Green Ninja, Day of the Departed, Skybound, The Island, The Pilots, Rebooted, March of the Oni, Masters of the Mountain, Tournament of Elements, Possessed, Rise of the Serpentine, Seabound, Hunted, and to round it all off, Sons of Garmadon. Is this the common consensus? Am I a massive contrarian? Do you disagree? Let me know. I do not care. I'm just glad to be done, and nothing can get me down right now. Not even the fact that I have thrown out my voice for like the 17th time during recording. I've been just up, you've been jumping up, kicking back, whipping around, and spinning. Thanks for watching.